Hey guys, welcome to part 7 of what if Naruto became serious during Chunin exam. If you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 22, Legacy Part 2. Legacies are meant to be looked on to either be exalted or scrutinized. They are events, tools, methods, and even philosophies left behind to be of use or to be discarded by the current generation. At least, that was what Shino knew. The legacies left behind the by their ancestors have certainly made an impact into their lives one way or another. The first Hokage for example, left behind the legacy of the village that is to create other villages of ruling power. That has always been the legacy of first Hokage. It could also be looked on as the time when Hashirama was looking for order in Sea of Bloodshed. The man had earnestly wished for a world where children wouldn't be sent to battle. What he didn't anticipate was the change not only in politics, but also the scale of warfare as well. To someone like Shino, such a thing was inevitable. Conflict was ingrained in every living creature's mind. Even the most basic of sentient life had conflict, such was the natural way of the world, he surmised. One cannot hope for peace when there is scarcity. But as nations grow, so do the knowledge and scale of battlefield strategy, tactics and weaponry, there comes a point where a nation or a group of nations would back off from war for fear of mutually assured destruction. The thought of massive destruction and man-made mass extinctions has not happened before and most likely never will in his lifetime. But Shino can be assured that he would be naive to think that conflict is avoidable in such a fear-ridden state. He understood nature with a very cold and calculating stance. He looked at the scroll in his hands and he asked himself if there was a conflict that existed between the clan and this man that he had only seen once in his life. In his hand was a scroll of his relative, an older cousin by the name of Torum. He had not seen or heard from the man ever since he was a child. So curious as to what might have happened to his cousin, Shino decided to learn more about Torum's mysterious disappearance and looked at the archives of his own home. He had looked over the files of his relative and was surprised that the profile written on the person had been wiped out. Torun had apparently wiped out his existence from the clan altogether. So when Shino presented his findings to his father, he was pleasantly surprised when he got an answer from his father. You are in the precipice of your growth, my son. What would you wish to discuss with me about our clansmen? Shino raised an eyebrow at this, it is to my understanding that Torun has vanished from our files. By all accounts, we recognize that he does not exist. Which leads to me to think that. He has done something terrible that our clan disowned him. No, son, your cousin is very much alive but he has relinquished his existence officially to join an underground operations unit. Shibi had answered for him, Shino tilted his head sideways ever so slightly. Shino was bewildered at this, I do not understand. Why would you allow for something like this to happen, father? There was silence for a few seconds before Shibi answered, because he willingly entered Root. Shino was perturbed at this, why would he do that? It is illogical for him to have entered it on his own accord especially if you knew of its existence. Shibi stood up as he went for a scroll and looked out to their garden. The sound of bamboo hitting rocks echoed around their home as the older man sat down by the floor and let his feet dangle on the edges. As we are a clan of shinobi, we are still subservient to the ministrations of the village first. When authority must take precedence before autonomy, then we are but foot soldiers for those that lead us into battle. Such is the way of the shinobi. Obedience is implied, not voluntary. And if he refused, Shino asked, he could not think of any answer as to why his cousin would willingly subject himself under the shadow of a vicious man like Danzo. Shibi once more didn't answer for a few seconds, he was contemplating on whether or not to answer the truth or leave Shino in the dark. He felt powerless in such an instance. Danzo would have come for you. He finally said. The thought alone stirred such a very disturbing image in his mind. His son being trained and mentally tortured to the point that he would be removing his entire being just for the sake of Danzo's interests brought a chill down to his spine. If that were to happen, then Shibi would have most likely defected. Did the Sandame Hokage give Danzo the authority to create his own Anbu unit? Shino asked and his father gave a nod. Sandame Sama understood the importance of Danzo's unit. He had given Danzo his wish but the man had gone too far with his methods and was thus unrecognized as part of Konoha's main forces. But the damage had already been done. 
Danzo has more than several units of elite Anbu members under his command and mostly recruits members who have no familial ties or orphaned by past conflicts. Sandame Sama knew of his works too late. But rather than appear weak in the eyes of the village, Sandame Sama chose not to act in order to maintain the image that we are not disunited for fear of another major war. And Konoha would fall should Sandame Sama chose to act rashly. To this, Shibi motioned for his son to come by his side as he handed the boy the scroll in his hands. Take this with you, it should prove useful. Your cousin isn't the only one who has had access to the Rinkaichu. His father did as well. Inside this scroll are notes meant for those who would wish to take the training in taming the Rinkaichu and a seal containing a summoning scroll from your grandfather, but I would rather see you safe than to take these tasks on your own. Shibi stood up as he patted his son on his shoulder, but as you are my son, it is also my deepest wish to see you grow and live longer than me. To see you become a man of great standing pleases me like no other. There is no logic to such a thing and there needn't be. It is simply out of the affection I have. Once I die and my flesh consumed by the earth, I will be happy to know that you are my legacy. Shibi then began to walk away as his son stood there, bewildered by his words. You will understand someday, once you have children of your own. Azumo Village. Panic was noticeable on Naruto's face as he watched his girlfriend be consumed by the waning space surrounding the shrine. Jiraiya remained calm as he frowned and looked at the aftereffects of the seal's unlocking. He watched as his apprentice followed only to be blown back by a field of energy and he was sent careening to the opposite end. Carrier of the will of the second son, you are not allowed to be given passage here. Only those who carry the blood of the Iwagami are given right to enter. The Iwagami shall only be the ones who can take this trial. The will of the second son, Hayuga Natsu asked out of nowhere. Jiraiya palmed his face and dragged it down out of exasperation. Shit, so much for secrets, Jiraiya murmured as Naruto remained transfixed on the gate of the shrine. Like hell I'm just going to leave it like this. Out of the way, Naruto molded chakra from his hands and sharpened them to a certain range before swinging his arms in chopping motions. The wind picked up from his actions and swayed with him as he targeted the gate of what he believed was one of the sealing matrices that kept the gate closed for him. Fudan. Kuakonzangeki, wind release. Space cutting strike. Naruto shouted as the wind phased through the distortion of space and managed to cut only the stone beside it. Naruto growled at this. His newest jutsu didn't work and the matrix was resisting it. Jiraiya had appeared beside him and held the boy on his shoulder urging him to stop. It's useless, boy, that seal is a Jikuakon, space-time, type of jutsu. Only those of comparable skill can be able to neutralize it. And you're not in that level yet. Naruto turned to his sensei and said to him, Teach me all about Jikuakon seals, now, Arrow Senen. Jiraiya shook his head, No, seals like those are definitely out of your league. They are way too advanced for you even with your talent. You're just going to have to put your trust in me to figure this seal out and you're going to help me. Naruto gritted his teeth and clenched his fists, anyone could hear the knuckles cracking loudly as Naruto tried to calm himself down. Hanabi however, decided to come after her elder sister but was held down by Natsu. You mustn't Hanabi-sama, we do not know of what lies ahead of the seal. B but, Oni-san. Hanabi struggled to let go, being a child. The grip of an adult was definitely very difficult to get out of. Hanabi turned around, desperate to follow her sister as she shouted at the top of her voice, Oni-san. This was the last thing Naruto could recall as his vision swam very suddenly and he blacked out. On the other side of the seal, Hanada had snapped out of her trance as she looked around. Scrolls upon scrolls, upon scrolls were littered all around her. They were placed in shelves, on the floor and neatly placed by the side. She grabbed one of the scrolls and immediately, she noticed the emblem that was emblazoned on the scroll's outer layer. It was the image of a spear pointing downwards to the left, with a sea of water towards the left and land on the right. Above the land and the sea was the cloudy sky. Sky, sea and land were surrounded by a circle while the spear overlapped the circle by its handle. Hanada caressed the symbol with her right hand and imagined how her mother would touch the scroll as well. She closed her eyes for a few seconds to let the image remain before she opens them and began to read a portion of the scroll. Let it be known that this scroll contains the records of the philosophy of Ninshu, its leaders and its actions. The Iwagami clan has seen its creation and through the clan's eyes, they shall write the chronicles of its first leader, 
Utsutsuki Hagoromo to his sons, Utsutsuki Indra and Ashura, where the feud of the brothers lead to the creation of the clans and thus, the eras of tragedy and war. It has taken you long enough to see what your clan has left behind. Hanada had snapped out of her concentration as she looked around to the source of his voice, finding a cub, no bigger than her leg, wearing strange and bejeweled ornaments on its chest and hair. Hanada looked at the small creature strangely, A and you are. You may refer to me as Bayako, the white tiger. I am the Kaze no Kiba, Fang of Wind, the guardian of Azumo's western side, and with the rest of my companions along with the Iwagami, and the legacies left behind by the brother of the Rikudo Senen here on earth, Utsutsuki Hamura. I was created from Hamura-sama's tooth, using the technique Banbutsu Sozo, creation of all things, and breathed life into us by mere flow of chakra, for Hamura had the power the same as his brother and like his mother before him. The tiger announced with pride as he held his chest out and thumped it with his right forefront paw. You were the one that was calling out to me. Hanada asked and the tiger gave a single nod. Only those of the blood of the Iwagami can be called into this sacred place. Those who do not contain the blood are forbidden to enter. Why? The descendants of the Rakuto Senen still thrive in the world, they must not know of the existence of this place, lest the work of Hamura-sama become undone. We are here to prevent such a thing from happening when the time comes. W. What does the Rakuto Senen have to do with your task? The tiger gave a huff as he turned around. Descendant of Hamura, should you wish to find out the answers, then you must choose, to seek us further into the caverns of this sacred ground and prove yourself or to remain here, knowing that you shall gain the knowledge of the Utsutsuki clan's history and the events that had led to this moment. Beware that once you have chosen us, then you must be ready to face death. Such is the way of the Iwagami. Outside, Senju, Uchiha, Hayuga, Uzumaki. These were the clans that had official records concerning their connections since the establishment of Ninshu. Beyond that, the period gets blurry as the existence of the great Rakuto Senen was thought of as a myth, a story to further exalt those who came from these clans. The Uchiha especially, since their eyes were given by the Rakuto Senen himself as the legends have stated before. To anyone who believed those stories, they would be in awe at the mere presence of the first recorded leader and inheritor of Ninshu, Utsutsuki Asura, standing before them through the body of a 13-year-old boy, one who had Uzumaki lineage and the scorned container of the Kayubi no Yoko. This shall be the first and last time that someone shall speak of me by my title through this boy. My awakening here has not happened by mere chance alone, I surmise, so let me speak as concise as I can for Naruto has begun assimilating me since he started his journey and my hope to finally stop this curse of reincarnation shall be realized through him. Indeed, I am he who the voice that you heard described. I am Utsutsuki Asura, the supposed heir to my father's legacy, Ninshu. Much as I am very irritated of having been forced out of this, this too, I think, shall be for the best as to not have any more complications concerning the validity of my own existence. Jiraiya had wanted to speak to the man personally, the one who advocated bonds to forge peace. This was the man who he had based his ideals on, the one who the Rakuto Senen had chosen to be his successor. But the mere presence of the man through his apprentice was quite an astounding experience. His mere chakra had brought the flowers around him to bloom and the branches to grow leaves as the life-giving force of his young chakra was so strong that it made the whole foliage of the mountainside livelier than before. It felt like every living creature was celebrating the arrival of the one who can breathe life into them by his mere presence. The two bodyguards there, Ko and Natsu, bowed to the man as the chakra overpowered their senses while Hanabi remained in awe as he watched the swallows perch on his shoulder and hands, life-giving energy flowing through his veins as he set them off to their journey. Of all the people to have the honor of being your reincarnation, why this boy? Ko asked out of nowhere, Asura merely smiled as he looked up to the sky. He could tell the disbelief that the Hayuga had just for the fact that he was housing inside the boy who the Hayuga had looked down upon. A being such as I cannot answer that for you, I am just as bewildered as much as anyone. Perhaps my father can give you the answers that you seek, but not me. Though it surprises me that this boy has had to endure more pain and suffering than I did, I cannot be more proud of my current incarnation. He has learned to connect to people and he understands human suffering better than any of my esteemed descendants. Though you look at him with indifference and even perhaps disdain for his status, he walks a path greater than any noble that I have come to know. He then looked melancholic as he sat down, with the gateway behind him. Which reminds me. 
He then looked at the people present at the shrine currently, you all have not learned a thing from my father. He then continued, three large-scale wars, millions of deaths, multiple sacrifices and extensions for peace and not one of you humans have learned the valuable lesson of empathy. Perhaps you have experienced pain and you have endured suffering as well, but this is not the way. Asura merely looked at the boy's tools in his hands, kanai, shuriken, paper bombs and the rest. These were not just tools, they were instruments of death. Ninshu has been twisted, a perversion of what it is supposed to be. My father taught Ninshu for peace just as I have, yet it has been changed dramatically to something I do not even recognize anymore. This is not the world that my father had envisioned. This is a mockery of his teachings. As if the elements themselves submitted to his will, Asura conjured chakra in his hands and in each of his fingertips, all five elements danced around them. They surged, spun and raged upon each finger as it reminded him of the harsh training he had to submit into in order to be at the same level as his brother. And within less than a second, all five primary elements vanished from his fingers. With enough courage, Jiraiya finally had asked the man of the question he had been dying to ask since Naruto's reveal to him. I don't understand, why did this now, why couldn't you have appeared earlier when it was just the two of us, Utsutsuki Asura? He has been perplexed by the man's strange decision especially with three individuals that weren't actually in the know of the whole situation. Asura answered with a neutral expression, he answered as truthful as he possibly can. Because I know you would believe him even if I haven't had the chance to appear. And it is a punishment, though I understand you would want to keep your home safe for him, you also forgot about him as his godfather. You have done a fine job in atoning, but it does not totally absolve you of your sins to him. Thus, you have brought him pain by thinking of what is best for him. Just as many of the people around him be they the people who look at him with hate or those who take care of him who insists on doing things for his benefit. It is the paradox of our own sense of justice. The paradox of our own justice? Jiraiya asked. True to what he had envisioned, the Asura that talked to him spoke volumes of philosophy and ideals. All of which, the man took after from his father. The boy has suffered much in between people who look at him as a symbol of hatred, and those who look at him for whom he came from. That is not justice, it is not empathy and it is most certainly inconsiderate to him. Let me ask you this first, what use is power without purpose? What use is wisdom without courage to act? What use is courage without wisdom to think? What is growth without pain? What is conflict without desire? These questions are the aspects in which I was taught about Ninshu and something people have forgotten by choosing an easier path. Something my brother has never learned through all the battles that we have fought in and something this boy has come to understand by his own struggles. Asura's chakra then turned golden for a second as it emitted from the boy, thus it is my sincere hope that this boy carries my legacy. He will be greater than you all and you will look at him in awe and people will follow him. Others will fear him, but they will be overcome not by his power, but by his understanding of people and their suffering. This boy does not dance to the tune of destiny but it is destiny that follows him. Asura then let his visible and dense chakra create silhouettes of people gathering behind the visage of Naruto as the soul inside the boy smiled, pain is but a tiny pebble in our steps and this boy too, he understands it and grows from it. For this alone, he is already beyond the reach of any common human. Jiraiya knew he nailed it when he thought of Naruto's Jinchuriki status as something of a symbolic nature. Internally, all of his signals were now designated towards Naruto being the child of prophecy spoken through the words of the great Toad Sage. If he had doubts before, he most certainly didn't have one now. It was then that Hinata finally got out of the gateway from the middle of the waning shrine and Naruto now fully gaining back his own consciousness as the flow of Yang Chakra slowly trickled down. Naruto now looked around. He could feel the ambient chakra around him slowly vanishing but the flora around him remained the same, lively and filled with energy. The birds that perched on his shoulder flew away as Naruto watched them fly. He looked towards the gate, standing there was Hinata looking at him with wide eyes. He noticed that her Byakugan was activated and she could tell that Naruto was the one who was emitting such a radiant and warm chakra that it made all the flowers bloom and attracted the swallows to rest on his shoulders. To Hinata's Byakugan, Naruto looked like the sun personified. Kiba and Akamaru. The duo of Master and Pet had managed to get out of the hideout in one piece. No thanks in part, to the Uchiha that continued to make Kiba grind his teeth in sheer annoyance. 
Being with that bastard in a team must be a fucking nightmare. I can't imagine anyone sane would put up with that asshole. Don't you think so, Akamaru? Akamaru barked in affirmation. Seeing that the Uchiha having that many cats made Akamaru think that Sasuke was terrible for having awful preference to cats and he always knew that the more cats a person had, the more likely it is that the person must be awful because of the stuff he heard from his master about cat ladies being horrible people. I knew you'd see it my way, boy. That asshole acts like a cat too, broody and quiet. He doesn't even look like one and he's got the ladies going after him. What's he got that I don't? Akamaru didn't know how to answer that so he just whined. Bitches always go for the alpha male and Sasuke somewhat resembled one being strong as he is. But Akamaru also knew that Naruto was strong as well and he literally is an alpha male material with just his chakra alone being able to eclipse anyone in the village and is closer to the Hokage's level, chakra-wise, than most people their age. Akamaru could tell from just the scent that people omitted that those who had the behavior and the scent of the alpha on them. And Naruto was untamable and as dominant as he can get if he wanted to be. The reason of Kiba's recent complaining was that from their arrival at the hideout, Kiba met a cute girl that was helping out this old lady who happened to be the one who was commanding the cats. The cute girl by the name of Tamaki had those same googly eyes that she was showing to Sasuke and was blushing when he took notice of her while he remained mostly ignored. Though Tamaki eventually did notice him, it was more in the lines of her just being friendly compared to Sasuke. Kiba never wanted to punch someone as hard at that moment and he felt like aiming it at Sasuke. Hearing the silence from his companion, Kiba let his shoulders sag a little, chicks dig bad boys. Is that it? It isn't exactly in my nature to be a complete asshole unless I'm in a fight. Even then, sometimes I think girls these days simply like androgynous men. And he had to admit, Sasuke would look good as a girl. Kiba had then vomited a little in his mouth. Sasuke being a guy is enough. Him being a girl doesn't change the fact that I want to tear his face off for being an asshole. But my mom would probably skin me alive if I did. The thought alone brought forth awful ideas about all of his friends suddenly gender swapping and he had to stop if he went in deeper. His thoughts were cut off when he had finally reached the shrine of the Inagami. The fabled shrine of the Inagami was said to have been the ancestral home of the Inazuka clan, they were more likely hunters than they were mercenaries, though. They started off as a nomadic tribe and hunted as a means of survival and thought to settle down near the prairies of Hai no Kuni, Fire Country. The lands around them served as a hunting ground and proved very bountiful even through the age of the warring clans. The old cobblestone path that led up to the stone base of the shrine reminded Kiba of a castle as he went up the steps and into the Torii Gate. It was common superstition even in this day that the Torii gates that were placed before entering a shrine were gateways to another world. In this case, he was entering the sacred ground of the temple as he passed by the Torii. He looked at the center of the temple and in it was a shrine dedicated to the Inagami. Kiba noted the silence that remained there. He had heard from his mom that the temple was abandoned years ago when the Inazuka left to join of what was now Konoha. They had people keep the place tidy and clean in honor of their deity and a tradition is born from the Inazuka as those who come of age to perform a pilgrimage from Konoha to this shrine to offer prayers and other things. Kiba chose to offer some meat to the shrine as he laid it to rest to the statue of the Inagami before he offered his prayers. As he was about to finish, he had heard a yelp that was certainly a dog's. He turned around to see if it was Akamaru but found his dog simply sitting beside him and looking at him quizzically. When he heard the whine of a dog once more, Kiba turned to locate the sound of where it might have come from. A few minutes of searching, he looked underneath the floor of the temple and found a small pup, with a broken hind leg on its left and looking quite famished. Feeling sorry for the puppy, Kiba grabbed his meat offering from the shrine and pinched some of the meat and fed it to the poor dog before he grabbed his water container and fed the dog from his palm. The puppy greatly accepted Kiba's help and in a matter of minutes, the puppy was a little more energetic and disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Kiba and Akamaru followed suit. Poof. Azumo village. Hanada was stunned. Revelation after revelation had hit her full force just after learning about the Iwagami and now Naruto hosting the rightful heir of the Rakuto Senen's legacy. If she were as weak as back then, she would have fainted from the shock. But this was just as hard-hitting as her finding out about the secret that the Iwagami had held for ages. So what have you learned, Hanada-chan? Naruto asked with a grin, glad that he could tell her his predicament concerning Asura. 
Hanada looked conflicted for a second, deciding whether or not she should tell the truth about what she had learned. Hanada never asked for Naruto's secret to be revealed but he did so anyway as a sign of his complete trust and the fact that he was discovered by Hanada's travel companions. He was eventually going to tell her, once he had undertaken Asura's training, that is and he could perform just as well as being noteworthy of Asura's pupil. Nothing as of yet, I have yet to read the scrolls inside, I just wanted to get out and think for a while if I decide to get back. But did you think that I would find you a liar if you told me about your other tenant? He sighed, not that it would be believable unless he had some form of proof for it to be true. Hanada slightly giggled at Naruto's reasoning to her as she daintily covered her mouth before she continued, yes, even I would have my doubts. But I know you, Naruto-kun. You wouldn't lie about something like that. You were always a bad liar, anyway. Naruto gave a sigh once more and slumps his head on the table with his hands in the small restaurant while they were waiting for their order. I know, I know. I'm pretty horrible when it comes to telling a fib. But it would have been nice to show you that I meant it. It's nice to know of the lengths of what you will go through just to tell me the truth, Naruto-kun, really. It shows how much you are willing to trust me and. Hanada blushed as she held his hand across the table with a smile, I can't be any happier than I already am when you open yourself for me. I feel happy knowing that you can come to me and ease your problems. A few tables across them, Jiraiya was writing furiously in his notepad as ideas began popping in his head. Oh this is gold. These two are so innocent yet so madly in love. Minato, Kashina, your son is a gold mine. If it were any more ridiculous, Jiraiya had smoke coming out of his nose as ideas flowed forth from his mind to his writing hand. Naruto merely looked at Jiraiya with a twitching eyebrow and a frown while Hanada was blushing and looking at the table. Instead of lashing at the old man, Though, Naruto turned his attention back to his girlfriend and grinned again at her, enough about me, what did you see inside? Hanada gave a nervous laugh and replied, nothing much, but I was greeted by this small tiger cub ant. Hanada then explained the details of the cub and Naruto listened intently. He frowned at the last part that Hanada could have the very real chance of dying if she were to take the offer. He thought about her safety and just how he would be devastated if he would lose her. But he knew that Hanada was willing to bet her life for this training, just as he would. But Hanada did not have the advantage of having a biju sealed inside him, thus negating the effects of much of the fatal potential in his training. But ultimately, the one who would decide would be Hanada. So with a heavy heart, he said to her, whatever makes you feel is right, I'll be there with you. Even if I would rather see you safe, Hanada-chan, I wouldn't give it a second thought if that's what you want to do. The only thing that I can give you right now is my faith in you. Whatever it is that you have to do or want to do, then go for it. Hanada looked at Naruto a little pensive about his statement before the blonde added with a smile, if you are willing to bet your life on it, then I'm willing to bet mine too. It'll be unfair if you were willing to take some of my burdens if I can't take away some from you as well. Hanada suddenly stood up, B but you have a job to fulfill. You're the reincarnation. Naruto sealed Hanada's lips with his finger as he gestured for her keep quiet. That just makes it an even bigger motivation for us not to fail, isn't it? He grinned and his smiles made Hanada sit back down and Naruto chuckled. With that behind us, I'm sure we'll both do great, don't you think so, Hanada-chan? Naruto had put a lot of faith in her by betting his life with her own. He was willing to die for her and even with her if need be. Such an unequivocal level of trust made Hanada's heart leap with joy. She hardened her resolve now as she looked at Naruto with a straight face and gave a nod, Naruto-kun, thank you for everything, for putting your faith in me, for having the trust in me to make the right decision, and for giving me this chance to stand beside you. I swear to you, I will take your complete faith in me and I will succeed in this training. Naruto smiled sincerely as he remembered Aruka's words about his description of Hanada. Hanada was shy, although she had the tools to succeed, she had always doubted her own self-worth. She always shrunk back whenever the attention was placed on her and with no one to encourage her, she always stumbled and failed. What Hanada needed most was that little encouragement and that little push to make her stand tall and try again. Most of all, what she needed was to be reaffirmed that she could do things better than what people expect of her. To have someone who could give that unconditional trust was not pressure, but an encouragement. And Naruto was willing to give that and then some.
He exuded the confidence that Hinata badly needed and Naruto, in turn, let her feed from his own beliefs and convictions. Naruto took Aruka's advice to heart and kept encouraging Hinata and told her that no matter what might happen, he would support her all the way to the end and he was willing to bet his life on it. She had made her decision and she is willing to go through it. The reason was not just because Naruto had encouraged her. It was also because she wanted to protect Naruto as well and to change the Hyuga. For that, she would need the necessary power to do so. Absolutely not. Ko shouted as he stood up from the table in the outpost, hands slamming on the wooden table. All the females and the two guards stationed at the outpost looked at Ko as if the man grew another head. I cannot allow Hinata-sama to take such monumental risks, support of Utsutsuki Asura's reincarnation be damned. Hinata scowled at this, I do not understand why you are so against this, Ko. With or without Naruto-kun, I would have willingly taken the offer. And risk jeopardizing the entire clan as well, Hinata-sama. You are the heir apparent. Your life is worth more than us. As your guardian, it is my duty to make sure you are alive. Hinata took a deep breath and paused for a second before she spoke, her conviction flowing through her words, this is more than just the Hyuga clan now, more than we could ever hope to realize. That is why I must take this step. It is essential and I will not stand by just as we are in the cusp of history's turning point. We cannot afford to be complacent, not now. Or else our clan will truly be wiped out. Natsu then asked the heir apparent, what have you learned past that gate, Hinata-sama? That there are things far more dangerous than just Orochimaru and Akatsuki, why I have to do this is to give our village more than just a fighting chance, but a chance to survive. If need be, I will be the one who shall obtain its strength and lend it to the village. Oni-sama, Hanada looked at her dear little sister who was looking unsure at first but ran to her older sister and hugged her tightly, although it's dangerous, I want to believe in you, Oni-sama, I haven't seen you like this before and I want to believe you because of it. Hanada gave a sincere smile as she reciprocated Hanabi's embrace as she said, Hanabi-chan, I want to see you safe. It is why I'm doing this. But what about you? Hanabi looked up. Hanada assured her, don't worry. I have an incentive to fulfill my promise. And I never broke a promise to you, have I? Hanabi shook her head. Then trust me when I say that I will be back. Hanabi then smiled at her elder sister and answered, yes, I will. Natsu merely shook her head as she gave a sigh, normally I would defer the authority on such a thing to Hiyashi-sama. But seeing as you will not be swayed any other way and will not change your mind, then I can only wish you luck, Hinata-sama. The maid then turned to Ko, you have done a good job so far, Ko. I think it is time we let Hinata-sama walk the path that she is meant to walk, or rather, the one she wants to walk. Perhaps this is indeed for the best. The remaining Hyuga in the outpost agreed with the maid's assessment. Ko merely sighed and went out of the outpost. If he consented, then he would not only be putting the clan in danger, he would also be held responsible for the fate of the eldest daughter. I need to get out and calm myself, I apologize for my rudeness, Hinata-sama. Naruto. The blonde had a lamp on as he read from the scroll, the various attempts of performing fuinjutsu. He had been rudely awakened by the fact that even with his talent, time-space seals were still much too complicated for him. They were the epitome of fuinjutsu skills, those raised at the highest order serving as a reminder of how good his parents were and how wide the gap was between him and them. Despite the huge difference in skill, Naruto was encouraged even more to learn the complexity of fuinjutsu. If not for the for its versatile use, then the sheer thought of his parents being so good at it that their skills were not only feared, they were renowned throughout the world was enough to convince Naruto that fuinjutsu was the art to go. As Naruto read the scroll in his lap, he leaned on to the board he had just created hours ago and took note of the problems he had with it. He was trying his hardest to make himself look busy and not think about the dangerous road that Hinata was taking. He was worried, but even if he knew he had to put his faith in her, a part of him still had that lingering anxiety and the possible scenarios that entered his mind. Uzumaki-san. His thoughts were cut short when Hinata's bodyguard, Ko had approached him. From the looks of things, he was looking as anxious as the blonde was about Hinata's predicament. You're one of Hinata's companions, right? What are you doing here? Jiraiya was inside, doing his own ministrations with his own scroll, writing another report to be submitted to Tsunade and preparing his student to what was possibly his most rigorous form of training yet. 
Jiraiya knew that Tsunade would most likely decline to having Naruto learn Senjutsu this early in his career, but a word in from Fukasaku and Shima should have her agreeing with them soon enough. He looked outside and saw the Hyuga's bodyguard approach his apprentice with curious eyes. He decided to remain silent and let the two talk, he knew for a fact that if he butted in, things could get worse. I am here to ask you to how you are taking Hinata-sama's decision to undergo this difficult task of hers. I am very disturbed by this news, Hinata-sama is the hope of our clan, without her ambition, the clan would descend into ruin. Naruto aptly put his scroll down and looked up from beyond his lamp and into the star-ridden sky. He sighed as he put his hands behind his head and replied to the man. You want me to stop her from taking such a dangerous proposition, right? Naruto reaffirmed what Ko said and the man nodded. The blonde closed his eyes as he didn't look at Ko for a second. Frankly, I'm just as worried as you and everybody else. It's the kind of risk that I wouldn't want anyone to go through if it can be helped. Then why approve of it? This is a delicate situation and knowing that she seeks your opinion in the matter only makes it worse for her. We simply cannot allow for her to take this phenomenal risk. Ko argued, but Naruto merely answered with a hum as he said. Hanada gets to decide her fate. She wants to take a gamble with this. She sees this as her opportunity to grow stronger. No matter how much I try to stop her, what I can't take away from her is her conviction to go through with it. Even though I would say she does so otherwise, the fact of the matter is that she thinks she has to go through with it. If she's willing to take the risk, then I'm willing to take mine as well. No matter what she does, I would have to be there for her all the way. Sometimes just having faith in someone is never enough, Naruto-san. Ko replied, he was very skeptical of the whole fiasco in the first place. And you need to have more faith in her if you think she's going to be your hope of stopping your clan's destruction. If you are willing to push for her to change your ways, then you have to be willing to trust her that she will be fine. But it is blind faith, Ko was about to finish his sentence when Naruto had cut him off. Sure it is, but sometimes taking that huge leap is something we all need to do, even if that leap leads to something unknown. I took that leap forward and now, I see a different path. Just know that I would be there with Hinata to give her my support. Ko was simply flabbergasted with Naruto's reasoning. It was just hard to conceive to have Hinata undergo such a dangerous trial for the sake of this boy who is possibly more exalted than the Hyuga clan itself. She is talking about something more dangerous than Orochimaru and the Akatsuki. I know not what she has found, but I dare say that this is something that is beyond her. Naruto simply gave a shrug, if she has a chance to change things, then she will take it. That is who Hinata is. She will take that opportunity and will see through it to the end. She'll survive, I know she will. This is ridiculous, said Ko in frustration. Naruto merely gave an amused smile. I'm betting on my life that she will succeed, Ko, and I have never lost a gamble before. Unknown place. When Kiba appeared on the expansive plains of grass and trees, he looked surprised when his surroundings weren't the same as it was before. Well, looks like I'm not in the temple anymore. Akamaru grumbled at Kiba's remark. Oh, and Inazuka, I haven't had seen one for half a century, chalk it up to little Ashimaru to be the luckiest pup in the pack. A voice remarked. It sounded deep and bellying. But it didn't sound threatening at all. Kiba turned around and saw a red dog slightly shorter than Akamaru and wearing a piece of cloth around its torso as a blade was sheathed on its right side with the handle having a guard and five studded spikes on the guard and at the hilt of it. The dog was perched on a tall rock formation, perhaps thrice a man's height. The canine was big and the fact that the dog was wearing an eye patch like Kuromaru reminded Kiba of her mother so much that he whimpered slightly. The canine grinned as it looked down from the rock it was standing on. I'm used to talking animals, since they're not that uncommon, but seriously, what the fuck? Kiba asked as he scratched his head. The big dog then hopped down through several stones as if they were steps and landed nicely in front of the only human and sat down. Akamaru was prepared and he spread his forearms slightly just in case. At ease, pup, I do not threaten your partner in the slightest. He has saved my son, after all. The red dog replied as it grinned while he sniffed Kiba. Pup. You mean that puppy that had a broken leg back in the temple? How did he end up there? Kiba asked. Ashimaru is always the curious little whelp. He would always venture forth to places unknown to him to pick up different scents and see new things. 
It is unfortunate that he had an accident trying to see the old temple where we used to go to. His pup has been known to be an explorer within the pack, often willfully going out of their home in order to see the sights that he would be telling in his youth. You used to go that temple before. Why'd you suddenly stop? Heba asked to the dog and the dog merely gave huff. You could say that once the humans left, we certainly had no other purpose to stay in that place. The elder has made that perfectly clear for us. The dog then looked at the boy straight to his eyes and said, with that being said, I sincerely thank you for saving Ashimaru. I am Yeba, the acting leader of the Inagami clan. Heba gave a nod. Inazuka Kiba, second in line to take the seat as the head of the Inazuka clan, I'm just glad that pup is safe. Yeba simply chuckled once more, that it is, Inazuka Dono. Am I to assume that you were at the shrine to perform your pilgrimage? Heba nodded. Yeah, my mother made me do it. I would have just made camp and trained out in the outskirts of the village, but then my mother has that instinctual ability that could tell if I was lying or not. I didn't want to take the chance. This time, Yeba gave a full-blown laugh. Well thanks to that choice, my son is saved. Come, let us discuss the terms of finally having the Inagami back on active combat. Heba fumbled at his words with this, ha, wa what? Am I going to assume that I'm going to be your clan summoner? Yeba grinned, a fair deal, pup. A life for a life, you saved the life of my child, I am indebted to you. Thus, our clan is indebted to you. It is only fair that we honor your deed by fighting by your side. Plus it has been close to a century since our clan has seen any form of action. Our old contract scroll was lost into the pages of history, probably destroyed. Heba couldn't believe any of this at first. Imagine his luck in continuing his journey, it sure made the trip of tolerating Team 7's asshole archetype totally worth it. Heba's expression turned to a large toothy grin as he turned to Akamaru and said with enthusiasm, this is awesome, right Akamaru? His companion couldn't agree more. Yeba gave a small chuckle as he looked at human's dog companion. I see the feral blood is strong with your companion, Inazuka Dono. There is much potential to learn from us. Would you agree for an extended time of your pilgrimage and train with us in order to understand how we operate? Yeba asked and Kiba nodded full force. I can maximize this thing for about three more weeks. After that, my mom would scour the countryside and have me clean the kennels until I'm 30. So yeah, let's get to it. It was then that two dogs appeared just behind Yeba. The dog on the presumed leader's right was brown and had a sharper snout than Yeba as well as a more contoured set of triangular ears. The dog's build was much leaner than Yeba and had a longer set of legs compared to the said leader suggesting that this canine had an emphasis more on speed and the crossbow saddled on its back further enforced what Kiba had been thinking. The dog on the left of Yeba was much bigger or bulkier for a better description. The dog had a shorter snout and its fur was black all over. Its jaws and cheeks were well defined, telling Kiba that this dog had a very strong bite and from what he could tell from the dog's jaws, it meant that he could probably lock it up too. Behind him was a collapsible twin-bladed lance. Allow me to introduce to you two of my subordinates, Kaishoku the lancer and Sokumaru the archer. Yeba then grinned, they are some of my fiercest and strongest warriors. Now, Inazuka Dono, you must prove yourself to us. Clenching his fists tight and with Akamaru already bending down ready for the charge, Kiba grinned Bifrei he bent his knees down. I'll gladly blow your expectations out of the water. Konoha. Mission Assignment Room. Abarame Shino was upset. Although no one could tell from the surface, inside, Shino was feeling quite vexed and angry. He knew for a while that Konoha wasn't as good as it seemed. He knew that all entities, no matter the origin and purpose, have a distinct dark side. Be it through history or approach, the lessons he had learned told him that neither figure nor society were perfect. Many things he had read through books talk about the impossibility of such a civilization. Yet, even after knowing such a thing was real, it certainly did not help his mood at all that his clan had been tampered with by a megalomaniac. His talk with his father smoothened a little and his questions were brought to light. But it did not quell his anger for the man that had taken away a part his family in exchange for him. How could such a thing be allowed? Against his will too. Thus, he had begun his training. He had never bothered to put a tangible goal before as he had no set goals other than the prosperity of his clan and his village. His dream could be fulfilled even if without his shinobi training, but now with what he learned, he had gained a certain goal now. 
As he thought about when he got to know his teammates and his sensei before they started, he now thought about a different goal, one where he will put his training to good use, one where his skills will be relevant. Torun Nisan, I will take you back from Danzo. Something on your mind? Shikamaru asked as he looked at Shino who then looked at the one in front of him. Shino gave a slightly raised brow. I would expect Shikaku-san or Tsunade-sama herself to give missions today, am I to assume that they are busy? Shikamaru nodded as he returned his vision to the scroll spread on the table. Yeah, they're discussing a meeting about something really important because Tsunade-sama counted it as an emergency meeting. The decryption department is already starting it. Shikamaru scratched his chin a little. The missions had already been filed out for the right people. I'm only here to distribute them, so excuse me if my debriefing can't be as comprehensive. Shino gave a nod as Shikamaru pulled the scroll with Shino's name on it from the box below the desk and pulled the paper out to read the contents inside. You're assigned to a route from Konoha to the border outpost near Taki no Kuni. Your mission is to make sure the routes are secure, bandits aren't normally a thing in Hai no Kuni, but I suggest to remain cautious nonetheless. You'll be staying in that outpost for about several months and relieve one of the members assigned there. Are there any other parameters that I should be aware of? Shino asked and Shikamaru gave a nod. Shikamaru smirked inwardly, he and Naruto made the right choice in choosing Shino on peer review. Their former classmate certainly knew his ropes even if Shino was only several months behind him and Naruto. None that are of concern, but do try to keep your distance from Takigakur Shinobi as well as keeping your curiosity to a minimum. I know you won't do so without considering your options, but shinobi from their village tend to be very serious about their secrets. If you think there is a problem, you're going to have to write an emergency report and stand by for further instructions until you deem it necessary. But I suppose you understand that protocol enough, though. Shino gave a nod and then said, am I to assume this will be long term? Shikamaru gave a nod and added, for someone like me, five days is already a long term mission. Your stay will be for about half a year, I reckon. But it will depend on Tsunade-sama just how fast her rotations on border patrol would be. We're still recovering pretty much from that invasion, so I doubt she will pull you guys out quickly. Understood, I will begin my preparations shortly. Shino then took the scroll from Shikamaru's hand and turned around to get out of the office. Maybe Shino needed this, to get away from the village for a while. He had been simply too wound up too stressed and just too upset to be in the village currently. Shikamaru could tell that Shino was tense, the boy's body language spoke it all, from the subtle curling and tightening of fists to tucking his hands on his pocket. Just as he was about to exit the room, he was met by Sasuke and Sakura who was already going for the door handle until touched it. Ah, Shino, it's been a while. Heading out on a mission. Shino gave a nod and replied, long term, nothing too dangerous, but it's important. Shino then looked at Sasuke, Uchiha-san, may I ask you something? Sasuke raised an eyebrow at this but answered with a grunt and a nod. To Sasuke, Shino was one of the least annoying people around. He could certainly tolerate Shino's silent observations and poignant remarks so he was at least amiable to what Shino had to ask him. How is life treating you in Anbu? Sasuke looked at Shino as if he had grown another head, wondering where that came from. Nothing much that I can't handle, they're letting me take on missions now. The training is rigorous but it's what you'd expect from an elite fighting force. Why do you ask? Interested in joining? Now that was certainly something to think about. Shino had never thought of joining Anbu, he had no desire about it and although he may just be perfect for joining with his skill set, he thought that the high stress workload, the psychological strain and high level of demand on their training alone brought second guessing in his head about joining it. Yet he felt mystified of this very exclusive branch of shinobi work. No, but I'm asking because of something important though I can't tell you anything about it, currently. Sasuke gave a nod, right, I understand. If you ever change your mind just approach either Kakashi sensei or me. And just in time, Kakashi popped in a cloud of smoke beside Sakura as the trio looked at him. I heard someone mention my name, anything I can help you with. Kakashi asked as Sakura gave a quick answer. We were just discussing something about Anbu, Kakashi-sensei. I think Shino might be interested in joining. Kakashi gave a hum at this and looked at Shino before he answered, his skills would be very useful in Anbu, but I don't think Shino would actually be interested in joining. You can tell just from looking at him, sensei. 
Sakura asked and Kakashi gave a smile beneath his mask, a hunch. That in it was a pretty well-known fact Shibi was not interested in letting his son enter Anbu anytime soon. The last time they let a child enter the Anbu, it resulted in the boy snapping and killing his clan almost entirely. And now, that only remaining remnant of the Uchiha clan was now his subordinate. It's not like he could argue against it, though. Kakashi had also entered Anbu at a young age. But unlike Itachi, Kakashi had entered Anbu at his lowest point, already broken, severely damaged from the trauma of losing people one by one. By no means had he buckled under the pressure of Anbu. In fact, if he had to be honest with himself, he enjoyed it. For a time, the numbing sensation of despair had always been behind him after the final straw that broke the camel's back and joining the Anbu, with all of its dangerous jobs and requirements, had given him a sense of feeling alive. The rush of life or death battles was always lingering and never truly disappeared. That was when he thought he could at least feel something. Whether the Anbu lifestyle had given him catharsis or not was certainly a question that he would never likely answer with himself, he didn't want to go there. There were moments where in the thick of it all, he felt like he wanted to die then and there and he didn't want to think about such dark thoughts now. I am merely investigating something. I had remembered something important and I decided to ask Sasuke-san to at least give me an idea of life in Anbu. Kakashi raised his eyebrow at this, oh, Sasuke. He's not exactly a real field agent, yet. But given a short time, he will be. He certainly has earned his mask and respect from his peers there. Are you really interested in joining? Are you going to change your father's decision later on? Unlikely. Though my skills can be useful. I am not suited to a much more demanding level of work. I feel that my current work level is sufficient enough. Shino replied before giving a bow to Team 7. If you're all done with bothering Shino now, Shikamaru remarked as he grabbed a scroll from his drawer and laid it out onto the trio. Here's the mission that Hokage-sama had assigned your group, Kakashi-sensei. She's asking you to go to a village near Kanabi Bridge. She says you were familiar with the place being a veteran of the Third War. Apparently, there are some suspicious people moving about outside it. They aren't asking you to engage but to investigate with a team from Kusagakur. It will be a joint mission since, apparently, Kusagakur is also shorthanded on men right now. It seems like many of our potential clients now know that we are lacking with shinobi personnel. So, to show a sign of goodwill and trade, the Hokage asked for one of his best junin for the job and for additional support. Sasuke raised an eyebrow at this, if I recall, you were also part of that operation weren't you, sensei? Kakashi gave a nod, I was. I was the one entrusted with the command of my group since I was the junin back then. My sensei entrusted that command to me while he was given a different role in that operation. Has Hokage-sama added any other protocols? Sakura asked and Shikamaru looked into the scroll. If encounters are inevitable, then capture is a must. But if it can't be helped, neutralizing the target would suffice. As Kusagakur willing for that to happen, though, I imagine we can't just perform unauthorized engagements on foreign soil without Kusagakur's permission. Sasuke asked and Kakashi replied, that's why it's a joint task force. If we are going to engage, then it is best when Kusagakur shinobi see us at the get-go. That would make sense, Sakura thought. When the debriefing mission was done, Kakashi and his team were about to exit when Tsunade had finally arrived looking serious as she motioned Shikamaru to get out which the Chunin all too happily accepted. Ah Kakashi, just in time, I was worried I wouldn't make it in assigning another member for your team. Said the Hokage. Tsunade then motioned with her head slightly and someone dropped from the ceiling with a fixed and almost disturbing smile on his face. He had a pale face, much paler than Sasuke but he was much as good looking as Sakura's teammate. He wore a pair of black pants that matched well with his long-sleeve outfit that was bare at midriff showing his abdomen. If it weren't any better, Sakura thought that this person was showing off himself to her. This is Sai, he's a recent recruit in Anbu like Sasuke. I believe he will do a fine job in replacing Naruto for now since you can't function as a four-man cell squad without Naruto. He'll basically do rotations on team 7 and 10. You can get your introductions on your way to Kusa. With that, Tsunade had dismissed Sasuke, Sai and Sakura but asked for Kakashi to remain. The three nodded without a word and went out of the room. Tsunade then spoke to the Junin, be on your guard with Sai. He's Donzo's subordinate, 
I can trust him following orders from you enough. But being a dog to that sleazy rat, he has ulterior motives, possibly to guard Sasuke and eliminate him should he be a threat. Kakashi nodded but then added, I think it's Sai who should be careful around Sasuke. His Anbu training doing well? Tsunade asked, it was unusual for Kakashi to put heavy confidence in someone else. By no means is Sasuke a slouch, he can pick things up faster than most people. What Sai should be worried about is Sasuke's growing skill set. Kakashi answered as he then added, Hokage-sama, you know what I am talking about, right? Tsunade gave a nod. Does he have control over the Mangekyu Sharingan? She asked and Kakashi gave a shrug. I don't know the extent of it, but I would surmise that he is reluctant to use it. The use of that stage is damaging to his eyes. It's why he's been training much more in versatility of his jutsu repertoire than the actual use of his dojutsu. He'll mostly rely on his fully mature Sharingan, but the Mangekyu. I would think that he would reserve that for his brother. He would continue with his statement but stopped when they felt the earth shake slightly, the vibrations causing her pen to fall from her table. Then a loud, thunderous boom escaped and the sound of a high-pitch whistle coming from outside. Quick to take action, Kakashi dashed outside to see what the cause was, his hands were instinctively clasping together to perform a jutsu of a most lethal kind but he stopped when he saw what the trouble was all about. Outside the tower was a heaving Sakura, breathing heavily with a massive scowl on her face, her right arm was extended and looked incredibly angry. Behind the Hokage's apprentice was Sasuke who was shaking his head and was holding his face with his right palm. But Sai was nowhere to be seen, Kakashi and Tsunade suspected that Donzo's agent was sent to lower earth orbit for that one. That's what you get for calling me ugly, you metrosexual troll. Cha. Tsunade looked amused at this, huh. What was I worried about again? Hokage-sama, your worry is misplaced and do you know why? Kakashi paused for dramatic effect, because people shouldn't ever fuck with my team. Azumo Village. Morning came and the sound of footsteps echoed throughout the sun-kissed dew drops on to the floor that was the shrine of the Iwagami clan. Out at front was Hinata. A look of resolve etched on her face while behind her stood her bodyguard, her sister's caretaker and her sister as well while out further back were Naruto and Jiraiya. As they approached the main shrine gates itself with Naruto and Jiraiya performing the seal again, Hinata drew a tiny amount of blood at the center as she then looked back at the people behind her. This is it. They all nodded and Naruto stepped closer to her, a serious look on his face. Hinata, I don't know how long you will be there. I don't know what kind of test is in there for you and I don't know what it is that made you decide this. Your bodyguard is right about one thing. I'm placing blind faith into your decision but I can't sway you to turn your back away from this. So with that in mind, I had Aero Senen help me with this. Naruto then handed Hinata a single piece of paper written with countless seals in the center, standing as its core was the word heaven on it. This is a healing tag seal, I placed some of my chakra in it to give you a one-shot chance to heal and replenish yourself with my chakra. Aero Senen explained to me the details of my chakra as having restorative properties due to Asura but I don't have full control of it and this is the only thing that can suffice for me right now since I'm bad at chakra control and healing jutsu. Hanada accepted the gift and noticed the bags under Naruto's eyes. Why you look tired, Naruto-kun? Did you stay up all night just to get this right? Naruto merely grinned at her and said, It's nothing I can't handle, Hanada. It's a small price to pay considering what you're going to have to go through. Consider it a small gift before I come back to Konoha, we can spend as much time with each other there. Jiraiya scoffed at this and mumbled, Not like he's going to cheat anyway. That boy is probably saving himself for his girlfriend. He then grinned as he continued, but what inspiration these two has become. It's like love in the purest form. Hanada decided to avoid Naruto's gaze and looked down with a blush on her face while Naruto had his left eyebrow twitching in annoyance but a blush of his own. There was just no escaping his godfather's embarrassing behavior. Wow, look at this old man, it's like he's acting like those crazy artists in the manga I read. Hanabi commented as both Ko and Natsu cleared their throats with a cough and decidedly not let Hanabi too close to the old man for fear of being corrupted. You're always the mood killer, you know that. Naruto shouted to the old pervert who ignored him and kept writing with a giggle escaping his lips. Oh my next book is totally going to sell. Jiraiya muttered as he continued to write without stopping on his notebook. After Jiraiya had gotten to control himself, 
Hinata turned her sights towards the group and spoke with a tone of surety of decision and resolve made of steel. It hasn't been stressed enough, but I am sure that whatever I encounter inside, I will need to solve on my own. This is my mother's legacy thus, the legacy of the Hyuga clan as well. For it to survive as well as the Hyuga, I will have to take this chance. Our future has always been on the line, but now. Now I think we have more than a fighting chance. Like a proud lioness, Hinata stepped forth, back straight and shoulders wide, her pride and her courage showing forth. As the heiress of the Hyuga, I will walk out of this trial, successful and victorious. And with that, Hinata walked through the gates, prepared to face even the most unpredictable. Inside, he was met with the tiger cub from earlier, a smile gleaming onto the creature's face. You have chosen well, descendant of Hamura. I welcome you to your trial and may his soul give you blessings for what is to come. Chapter 23 Book 2 Legacy Part 3 You have chosen well, descendant. Your choice to take this task takes nerves of steel. That you have my respect said the cub looking up the Hyuga heiress as she answered in resolute fashion. I am prepared of what it may entail. Then come, I shall show you where your trial shall take place. Hanada had resolved herself as she saw the multiple wall paintings depicted on the walls of this hidden cave. She could see both the conflict-ridden paintings of two factions spiraling into the void where a lone white woman standing taller than others were with her hands outstretched surrounded in a dark circle as if she was pulling everyone along. But she also saw something odd, she saw both the sage of six paths and his brother going on their separate ways, with the sage surrounding himself of what she could tell as the tailed beasts while Hamura, taking some of the power of her mother, decided to cut off a small part of his horn, one tooth, a nail and a piece of his hair, scattering it to the wind while holding up a familiar hand sign. For years, the Iwagami has kept records of the time the of the establishment of Ninshu towards every major conflict that has occurred around the world the last work that they did centered around the time of the Third Shinobi War. Hanada took note of the tiger's message who had sensed her curiosity as he motioned for the girl to look at the final painting that shook Hanada to the core. Countless upheavals, bloody massacres, genocide in the name of peace, from the destruction of Kanabi Bridge to the single-handed routing of Iwa Shinobi by the hands of the fearsome fourth Hokage, the yellow flashes he had been titled beneath his caricature-like image of a faceless blonde man and another title that would have made sense in the eyes of Iwa's citizens. The Butcher, Hanada had never looked at it from the perspective of the opposing side's eyes. Indeed, it made sense for them to view the yellow flash as a monster who slaughtered countless Iwa Shinobi, whose lives were snuffed out during the war by a single man who had mastery over time and space. Then she saw another image, an island in the middle of the sea, whose fires raged above the lush green leaves of its trees, a sea of red mixed with the water, heads floating on the sea dripping with blood three factions of shinobi from what she could tell that came from Iwa, Kiri and Kumo. Underneath this portrait written neatly, the genocide of the Uzumaki. Hanada froze for several seconds. Uzumaki. Naruto-kun's clan. Are you shocked by this painting? I would have surmised that this would have been taught in Konoha of all places. The thousands of lives snuffed out in Uzushiogakur was a blight in modern history that it ought to have reminded the five nations of the treachery of its own flawed system. I don't understand, why were the Uzumaki clan destroyed by a three-nation alliance? This doesn't make sense. The truth is almost always more complicated than what is out. The three countries governed by Iwa, Kumo and Kiri did have a hand on its destruction but the Uzumaki themselves attracted that destruction due to what they perceive as a growing hegemony of the five powers. It pains me to say, but even with the watchful eye of the Iwagami, the Uzumaki were able to hide why they were subjected to destruction and the only thing we have obtained was a name. The white tiger gave a sigh as it continued. Minamoto no Banbutsu, source of all creation. Kiba. Yeba had walked ahead of Kiba and Akamaru who had followed him around in the prairie the second child of the Inazuka clan had been amusing during his stay in their territory. The leader of the Inagami had evaluated Kiba's contribution to the pack and he had fitted right in on the first day by obeying the hierarchy of their group. The boy was an Inazuka through and through. Much like his ancestors, the Inazuka had lived in harmony with the Inagami, they had lived off the land that they surveyed. Kiba was no stranger to their hunting tactics. They hunted in packs much like wolves did and everyone did their best to coordinate their attacks effectively. Yeba was impressed. This Kiba boy knew how to work with other people, an essential skill that all pack members must be accustomed to. Say, Yeba-san, I've been meaning to ask this, 
but since you separated us from the pack, where exactly are you taking us? Yeva answered him with an amused smile, I'm taking you to the sacred grounds of the Inagami since you passed my test. Test? Kiba asked, he didn't even remember he was being evaluated. He could have sworn that what he had been doing for the past several days have been the training he needed. Yes, boy, a test. I wanted to see how well you blend in with a pack. Kiba scratched his head at this and answered as if it was the most basic thing he had been doing all his life. Well, I've been pummeled with all kinds of lessons concerning pack etiquette and teamwork ever since I started my life as a shinobi. My mom has been hammering that lesson since Akamaru and I were pups. And Kurunai Sensei has been our team leader all this time, she's pretty much told us to always stick with our group. Yeva hummed in contemplation, he was glad that the humans had kept the tradition of working as a unit alive and well. The Inazuka were indeed kindred of them in spirit. And that is a lesson you should never forget, pup. Alone, your senses can only tell you as much, your mind can only process as much. But a group accumulated as power in itself. The more you have, the more power you shall wield. Kiba smirked. Of course, I plan to be Hokage. I'd need all the help that I can get to be one. An aspiring alpha, Yeba could not find a better boon. They had managed to stop just before a small hill at the top of the hill was a large tree, its roots to the bottom were visible as it latched onto the ground at the very bottom of the hill. Come, we will go around the tree and enter the lair. There you will see our gift, Chikusuki no Buso, accumulation of armaments. Kiba was thrilled to hear such a badass sounding name. As they circled around the base of the tree, he noticed that the giant tree's roots had outgrown the curvature of the hill and almost a quarter of the hill was nowhere to be seen, only jagged cliffs and stone pathways littered this side of the hill. Down below, Kiba could only see a small creek. When Yeba had entered into the main part of the cave, Kiba followed suit and then noticed a purple glow slowly coming to life inside and he could hear something peculiar at the very end of the cave. There at a jagged stone dais was placed a small silvery orb glowing iridescent blue chakra, with its rays touching the branches and glowing faintly giving off the purple color that escaped between the gaps of the roots. This is Chikusuki no Buso. An orb of collection of weapons from one of the Godai Senen, Kinzoku no Senen, Hermit of Metal. He gave birth to it as a way to train in every day. He emphasized that the strength of the body is also the strength of the mind. That in order to be one with nature, one must understand the circle that they belong to and must excel in all its forms. Thus, he has left this orb as his greatest creation to us of the Inagami. Great, so how do we do this? Kiba asked, eagerly anticipating what was coming next. Yeba grinned, fangs showing as the patriarch then said to Kiba's partner, do not interfere, pup. For this will be a painful experience to your master. And Yeba pounced. Shino. Since arriving at the border between Taki and Hino Kuni, Shino had been briefed about the many nuance within the work with the outpost. Concerning his meeting with his seniors here, he found that there were many customs that he was not privy to concerning ninja of Takigakur. Although they were allies, the Taki ninja only wanted to deal at an arm's length all trades were done via the border, supervised by a Taki shinobi along with a Konoha shinobi. All wares and trades are to be inspected before being resealed by said Taki ninja and no Konoha ninja should be able to cross more than 200 meters past the border line. It was a well-known fact that Taki liked to keep its secrets but he was surprised with the extent of how much they were willing to go at lengths to keep it that way. Shino had looked up at the sun beneath the shade of trees today. The wind was blowing nicely, he surmised. It sure helped him relax after a long day of work and training. In his hand was a summoning contract kept by his father and passed down to him. He had never seen his father use a summoning before but it was probably for the best. After all, if it was necessitated, then it meant that the situation was dire. Shino then performed hand seals together and then bit his finger before planting his bloodied hand on the ground. Kuchio's no jutsu. Then a large pillar of smoke wafted from the summoning circle that Shino had created it went to be about as high as a two-story house and about as wide as well. When the smoke dissipated, he was met with a small blue horn beetle the size of his palm. Shino, although he didn't show it, inwardly was disappointed by how much plomp that the jutsu initially had. All bluster, no substance. W.H.O. dares awaken the emperor's spear without warning. Angrily shouted from the small horn beetle. The creature looked around and found a shaded boy on his knees holding a summoning contract in his left hand. Wow so cool. 
Another surprise, Shino noted, Ataki Shinobi had managed to slip right through his senses and looking down at the small blue beetle Shino jumped back and although he did not show it, the tacky ninja had left him a nervous wreck. A ninja caught off guard was always a bad thing. W-H-O the hell are you, girl? As if casually not caring about the agitation of the blue beetle, the teal-haired girl replied with a wave and a spunky attitude that could beat even Naruto's, the name's Fu. I'm here to make a thousand friends. Are you the one who summoned me? The beetle testily asked and Fu laughed it off saying, I wish I had. This further irritated the creature, I'll have you know that summoning US is a hallowed tradition of a certain clan. Some simpleton like you would have never summoned someone such as I. She already said that she wasn't the summoner. Shino thought in exasperation, he had to stop this pointless conversation. The boy raised his hand. It was me who summoned you, Shino voiced out, his soft-spoken voice was heard amidst two loud individuals. The obnoxious, tiny but loud creature looked out to the boy Konoha Chunin and spoke with no indoor voice, I see. Very well then, I ask that you state your name and your heritage. Abarame Shino, current heir apparent to the Abarame clan in Konoha. I am of Chunin rank and currently the holder of the summoning scroll that you have entrusted to us. The beetle was quick to react, fool. I'll have you know that summoning US is a hallowed tradition of a certain clan. State your name and heritage. Inwardly, Shino wanted to pummel this creature out of his hair. He had done something quite troublesome. The one on his side only laughed jovially while still trying to make a conversation with the beetle that only cared about hearing his own voice. Somebody, somebody save me. Azumo. A certain popping sound was heard right next to the eldest of the group just outside the warped temple of the Iwagami. Jiraiya looked down and saw a toad messenger that he recognized that came from Earth Country. The toad began to enlarge its stomach and spewed out a scroll that Jiraiya noted to have come from one of his contacts. It had the character diamond emblazoned as the seal that kept the scroll shut and it was recognized by Jiraiya as one of his many codes he had given his agents in his international web. A correspondence from my agent in Iowa. But I just received one a few days ago. Did something happen? He picked up the scroll and noticed that Shima and Fukusaku were looking at his student intently as the boy stared at the warped space in front not even fidgeting or even moving from his spot eyes staring at the space a feeling of anxiety looming over him. I see you were preparing him for his lesson in Myobokuzen, Jiraiya-chan. Shima commented. Jiraiya gave a nod. He's slowly getting there, but he can be easily distracted, it's not in his nature to focus long in his training. He tends to jump from one lesson to another except when it comes to Fuenjutsu. Fukusaku shook his head at this, Jiraiya-chan. I don't know about you, but I think Naruto-chan is ready for actual Senjutsu training. Jiraiya's eyes widened. He had not realized that Naruto was already at this stage in the beginning phases of Senjutsu, has his student met the requirements. Looking at the boy, Jiraiya noted that Naruto's usual restlessness was not present, he was as still as a rock as he watched the gate that his girlfriend had walked into. He barely moved, only breathing and blinking as he noticed his hands were clenched to fists and clutching the fabric of his outfit. He had noticed that already an hour flew by, and Naruto still did not even move a muscle. Since when was his student able to maintain that perfect stillness? Naruto, there is only so much you can do. Don't worry yourself to death. All you can do now is have faith. Jiraiya had interrupted, the blonde was silent for a few seconds before he relented. I know, I know but this kind of thing just makes me worry even more. Jiraiya noted Naruto's impulsive nature still existed. He had succeeded in curbing that part of him to a tolerable level befitting of a competent soldier, but that nature was something that will be difficult to get rid of for good. Not much was needed in order for his blonde student to act but now that he can't do so, it forces Naruto to watch as others are forced to act except him. It was like a test, in a way. Naruto, come here for a moment. Jiraiya instructed his student. Naruto for a few seconds, did not move, intent on waiting for Hinata to go out of the warped space in front of him, but he ultimately decided to stand up and go towards his master. Your worry will only be a waste of time. I know you already know this, but have faith in her capabilities, kid. Don't tell me that all you said about her were only just to comfort her. Those are empty words, kid. No, I believe in Hanada, I do. It's just, given the situation of life and death here, I also understand what Hanada's bodyguard is feeling. 
Naruto glanced at the Hyuga trio for a few seconds before turning back to his master. I do too, kid. Believe me, I know that feeling. Sage knows how many times I must have worried over sending your father on his first solo mission as a Chunin and then a Junin. Jiraiya noted reminiscing his younger days as he fretted over his prized students that day when they were promoted. Especially Minato, even though he had a record of going on his own, rescuing Kashina, it still had him worried to death about their well-being and if ever he had taught them adequately enough to give them the highest chances of survival. Jiraiya then smiled, as he remembered Minato ascending ever so closely to the title of Cage, marrying the love of his life and dying a death worthy of a shinobi. But that worrying was useless. As it turns out, I'm the best damn teacher in the village anybody could ask for. He gloated and laughed as Naruto suddenly got annoyed at his master's antics. Which he couldn't even refute. Jiraiya taught Naruto's father, who in turn taught Kakashi sensei, and in turn, taught them. Both his father, who became Hokage, and his sensei, who was worthy candidate to be Hokage, carried legacies that Naruto was still in awe of even if he didn't admit it out loud to the perverted hermit. Yeah, yeah, you're the teacher of the fourth Hokage, Eero Senen. You're the cage maker. Naruto replied but he smiled at his master's antics all the same. A silence ran between them as Naruto once more looked at the distorted temple. Naruto, one day, you'll be Hokage. And one day, you'll be facing this certain problem too. It's one of the reasons why I didn't think I was fit to become Hokage. You'll be faced with decisions like this. Most of the time, you will be forced to send someone to act on your behalf. You won't be able to manage everything all the time. No one is able to do that. Not even you, your guts and your shadow clones. You'll be stuck in your office, unable to do anything even after knowing the fact that you might have sent someone to their deaths. Because for the Hokage, the village must come first. The Hokage is important not because he's strong. Naruto had finished for him, it's because the Hokage always does what is best for the village. Jiraiya stopped for a moment and then smiled. His current student may not be the best in his long life of being a mentor, but Naruto always had his heart in the right place. Jiraiya thought of this as he placed a hand on Naruto's head and ruffled it affectionately. Good kid. It was then that Naruto was approached by the two elder toads with Fukusaku speaking first, Naruto-chan, you may have not noticed but you were able to remain in perfect stillness for an hour. Tell us, how long have you been able to do so? Naruto looked at the two old toads and replied, I don't know. I just happened to do it just now. Though I've been trying to do that for at least a year now. Fukusaku and Shima smiled, the female elder toad then spoke, it seems Jiraiya-chan wasn't easy on you, huh? No matter, I suppose he has done a good job in preparing you. Naruto raised an eyebrow at this, he had been doing that exercise as a preparation. For what? Shima smiled at the blonde's expression and said, that look on your face tells me that Jiraiya-chan hasn't told you the importance of standing still, correct? He said it was to prepare me for what's to come, though. Naruto replied as he sat down to level with the toads as much as he could. What Jiraiya-chan was teaching you was the first exercise in learning Senjutsu. Fukusaku said this as the old toad raised its right foreleg and counting the necessary for his lecture. You see, Senjutsu is four parts, stillness, sensing, gathering and balance. By remaining still, you begin to feel natural energy around you. Though it is subtle at first, it takes immense focus to remain still and feel the natural energies around you as step two. That second step then allows you to perform the final step, gathering that natural energy around you to attain balance. Jiraiya gave a nod at this, I'll tell you all the details once we actually begin. But safe to say that Sage Mode is the result of that ability. Since you're bad at Jutsu Seal memorization even though you're turning out fine now, I think this is the next step in your abilities, kid. That and it will be your ace in the hole in controlling your friend there. What does Sage Mode actually do, Aero Senen? Naruto asked and Jiraiya grinned. Glad you asked, kid. Senjutsu is actually a pretty good way of powering up. It enhances all your physical skills, makes you faster hit harder and take beatings like it was just a passing wind. It also enhances all your jutsu too. Best part is, this technique suits you because your chakra is not only more potent, but also large enough that you can't be overwhelmed with natural energy. The benefits outweigh the risks for your abilities, kid. 
With such massive reserves rivaling only a cage could, you're a natural fit to learn Senjutsu. Jiraiya said as he saw Naruto looking amazed from his claims. It was true that learning Senjutsu did have its perks, but only select few people were qualified to learn them and learning them must be strictly supervised because of many of its treacherous drawbacks. But that was if only the person did not have a natural affinity for it in the first place and after learning much of what Naruto had been through and what he carries and what he was given, it seems like the perfect skill for Naruto's abilities. So when can we get started? Naruto asked and Jiraiya's grin disappeared, turning into a frown, you're ready to learn it, kid. But I want you to know that we won't be exploring that path until you've learned you can sense that energy and the only way to familiarize your senses is to learn at specific sites of the world where there are hotspots of it. Natural energy may be free all around us, but there are unusual sites in the world where it is dense enough to be sensed by trainees. Don't worry, we'll be getting to that place soon enough, but not now. We still have one more place to go before we get to Mayobokuzan. Where's that? Naruto asked as the two elder toads looked at their former pupil and Jiraiya replying to the blonde, to an old place where your mother used to live. We're going to Uzushiogakur. Naruto's expression turned to a surprise at this, isn't that place in ruins? Jiraiya nodded his head but replied, it's true, but I'm fulfilling a promise. A promise to your mother. That I take you there just as much as what Hiyashi had done to his daughter. We have about a month before we start training for your senjutsu. Jiraiya's grin was back in full force as he looked at the warping temple and said to the blonde, besides, don't you want to see your girlfriend coming out of that place, triumphant? Naruto, infected by his master's smile, smiled back too. Naruto had desperately wanted to see Hinata again after all this trouble. He looked back at the warped temple, he could see the ripples of time and space still active there. He went back to where he was, under the shade of a large tree and sat down in front of the gate. Now more at peace with himself than he had before. Is Nei Sama going to be safe? A voice of a girl asked. Naruto's attention turned to the little girl who was now sitting beside him, a look of worry and anxiety laced her petite face. Naruto could only smile as he stared back into the gate. Let's believe in her, Hanabi. I'm sure she'll be fine. She's strong, in mind, spirit and body. Hanabi seemed to have accepted that as she gave a small smile on her own and stared at the gate beside her sister's boyfriend. Naruto was right, all she can do right now, was have faith in her sister. She had realized then, that truly strong people had an inner will that lets them face uncertainty head on. And she knew her older sister had that in spades. Inside the temple, this is the inner sanctum of the Iwagami. The tiger cub turned to him and Hinata was amazed to see such a large dome almost perfect in shape inside this cave. She saw a small lake just beside this vast dome, it was as large as at least a fourth of Konoha in her mind and lush grass and vegetation seemed to grow here despite a limited ray of sunlight. Up above, she could see light shining from above, it must be the peak to one of the top of the mountain heads. She had surmised. So, the Iwagami descendant has finally come. Hanada was surprised by another creature speaking to him, she had turned to the source of the voice and found that it was a small red bird perched onto one of the stone ledges. It was round and about the size of her lower legs, its small wings seemed unlikely to give it flight but Hanada noted that the bird had managed to perch on an otherwise almost impossible place to climb on without chakra. Ah, I can feel that distinct chakra. Another creature, a small black tortoise surfaced from the lake its tail stretching out with a snake head that curved upwards and now standing on its shell. Strange. This one is most strange indeed. The snake said as the tortoise looked up to the snake, I have never felt chakra like this before, as if something is awaiting to be awakened. I sense the Iwagami within her and a Hyuga at that. It must mean that she is the heir of both clans. Said a little blue lizard as it slithered around with its legs at the Hyuga, sizing up Hanada before nodding. Bayako. Do you not think this is more than a coincidence? The white tiger cub shook its head, I believe not, Seryu. I have felt the chakra of the Iwagami outside and attracted her with our chakra, however, in came the Hyuga before you. Interesting, isn't she? That she is. I am assuming then that she will be undergoing the first trial. Hanada nodded. No ounce of hesitation or fear showed in her face, only determination. Bayako then smirked and then glowed with chakra, 
white wisps of smoke entering its body as it grew to a size much larger than that of a normal tiger and growing to about the size of a gigantic one that was comparable to those at the forest of death. Then we shall. Your first trial will be fighting me. Hanada braced herself as she went into the Jukan stance, her Byakugan activating and suddenly seeing a gigantic mass of chakra in front of her. It was not as big as that of a tailed beast, but still big enough to almost frighten her to a degree. But still, she had to stand her ground. Naruto-kun, much like you carry my hopes and my dreams, I will carry yours too, here I come. The white tiger then pounced at her, claws outstretched fangs bared. Hanada was quick to dodge, using the footwork she had come to know and performing a half-circle direction and striking her opponent to its side. The tiger immediately hopped to the side as Hanada was quick to capitalize move and sent an air shell to the tiger's side. It managed to land, but the tiger merely skidded back. Although small, the other creatures seemed to have been impressed with that much anticipation that the Iwagami spawn had in mind. Interesting, you managed to land a hit on me this early on. The white tiger then smirked and growled, I will not be making the same mistake. Senku, battle cry. The white tiger made a mighty roar, it caused the earth to shake slightly and the air to vibrate causing a blast in the shape of a tiger's head towards Hanada who had to quickly come up with a defense. Hanada then focused chakra to her palms to a certain pinpoint sharp enough to pierce almost anything and began thrusting her palms upwards in rapid succession, the effect was immediate, it seemed as though Hanada was casting a net of chakra all around her. Shugo Hake. Rokuji and Sho, guardian of the eight trigrams, 64 palms. This jutsu was one Hanada created many months ago, it was a technique to compensate for the kaden which she hadn't learned yet it was simple enough to provide enough defense for her at that time. Although it was much simpler and lesser effective than the kaden, it certainly was more efficient and less taxing than performing the kaden, which required her to expel chakra to all her tenkutsu and spinning around. The ethereal tiger collided with her jutsu clashing with her barrier field and repelling it back with every thrust of her arms. It was not to be, as the blast effectively overwhelmed her defenses and smashed into her body as Hanada was sent flying back. Hanada skidded on the stone floor, her left long sleeve was torn away and a gash had formed on her arm, blood seeping down from it. The small injury did not deter the Hyuga as she stood up and wordlessly went back into her stance again. The four creatures were quick to notice. She might have taken that attack, but the brunt of Bayako's attack was mitigated by that barrier. Seriu commented as the red bird landed near it as it spoke. Don't you find it strange, though, Seriu? I recall of the Hyuga having a technique with superior defense in mind. Does she not know of it? The black tortoise was the one to reply, certainly, the Kaden would have proven to be more useful. But I cannot say that her method would have been ineffective as well, Suzaku. But it did not stop Bayako's attack entirely. She could have avoided being hurt if she used it. The snake countered, her defense would have indeed been more effective if she used Kaden. So she must not know the jutsu. Or she does not see the tenkutsu as the other Hyuga. The red bird discerned. Hanada remained in her stance her eyes hidden by her bangs as she placed her bloodied arm forward while her right hand was at her side. I can still fight, and Bayako obliged running at the Hyuga with the intent to kill. The tiger did not mince words, it had obliged the heiress. Bayako stretched out its paw as it got near, sharp nails appeared intent on rending her flesh apart. Hanada could see despite not moving her head as she leaned forward and closed her three fingers leaving only her index finger and middle finger straight. Time seemed to slow down as Hanada ran straight and quickly raised her hands in successive motion and began to quickly thrust her fingers to the tiger's underbelly in rapid-fire succession. PST. 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 She slid on the ground and ended standing up just behind Bayako. Hanada looked back, her Bayakugan still active, as Bayako fell on the ground with its tenkutsu struck. 12 Tenkutsu. Hanada murmured as she went back to her stance and faced the tiger. So she does know, Seriu commented as it stroked its long whiskers with its tiny forelegs. Bayako staggered as it growled. You had me fooled, thinking that you cannot see the tenkutsu. You are capable, girl. Hanada shook her head and replied, I had no intention of doing so, Bayako-sama, I just thought that I did not need to expend chakra for Kaden. I misjudged that attack on my part. I see. I think I understand now. The black tortoise said as if the snake above its shell continued. 
It is not because she does not know it, but rather her Kaden is a last resort for absolute defense. She can perform the technique, but it costs her chakra that she isn't comfortable with the amount. The red bird, Suzaku, then replied, is she truly an Iwagami? That much chakra expelled should not be a problem for her. You can sense it, can you not, Genbu? Steel hiding within silk, cunning within beauty. A proud lioness stands against our tiger. Seriu muttered and smiled as it saw Hanada going on the offensive against Bayako. Poetry in such a time, Seriu. You can tell, right? This human is hiding more than she lets. Suzaku pointed out this fact as the black tortoise answered for his fellow creature. It matters not, Suzaku. If the Iwagami child does not use all of her full potential, then she will not be recognized. Hanada then avoided another paw swipe from Genbu and instead of attacking the underbelly like last time, Hanada decided to run past the tiger hand legs and turned around and jumped as she landed on the back of the tiger. Her right hand raised for a downward palm strike, she was suddenly interrupted when Bayako shouted. A grave mistake. Bayako no Takashio, storm surge of the white tiger. Just then, the wind picked up around the tiger and with unimaginable speed, the tiger disappeared from Hanada's view she fell down and her Bayakugan still active, she had no way of knowing where the tiger will appear so she did the most sensible thing she could do. Hakusho Kaden, 8 trigrams whirl. And just in time, as the white tiger smashed its way to her absolute defense from above in such a force that the ground she was standing on caved in. The white tiger was surrounded by powerful gusts of wind. Smash. Hanada did not give in. She continued her spin as much as she could as the white tiger kept pushing and pushing until it gave up and jumped back. Hanada kneeled on one knee a small gash made its way into her forehead, she had never thought that she could expend so much chakra with so little time and that a moment later would have spelled her doom. Bayako's abilities were wind-based, she had surmised. That last attack not only enhanced Bayako's speed but it also gave the white tiger a spherical barrier around itself that could cut anything that gets close to it. Her jacket was torn, only her grey blouse remained in the mesh armor beneath. She panted as she jumped up. She would not quit now. Not now. Not ever. Oh, she managed to repel Bayako's attack like that. Though it seems like she's nearing her limit. Suzaku mentioned as Bayako smirked at this. It seems this trial is over. You cannot overhelm me with what you are now, girl. Hanada despite her panting and the blood she was feeling right now, merely spoke at the white tiger. I will win this, I will defeat you. I will save the Hyuga, I will support Naruto-kun. I will help him carry all that he has to bear. Because that is my promise. Stubborn one, aren't you, girl? Let me warn you. If I strike you now with my attack, you will really die. Stop now. You can challenge me again once you've grown strong. Hanada smiled at this. I am prepared, Bayako-sama. But I will swear to you, I will win. Bayako closed its eyes for a second, saying his prayers of forgiveness to the souls of the Iwagami who had died before. The tiger was going to comply with this brave girl's request. Then I will oblige you. Bayako no Takashio. The white tiger suddenly disappeared once more and Hanada had already set up the Kaden in advance. And then another strike from above, Bayako slammed to the Kaden once more and this time, Hanada could feel the weight of the attack trying to pierce the very dome of chakra she had created as she continued to spin. It's stronger than before, Hanada thought as it slowly, inch by painful inch, her dome was slowly being beaten. Then, her chakra flow abruptly stopped she could feel her body suddenly feeling heavy. Her chakra had depleted to near zero, she could not do Kaden anymore. She could not move, she could not react in time as a large nail was about to make its way towards her head. No, as if her life was flashing before her eyes, Hanada could see the faces of those she cherished deeply. Her peers, Kurunai-sensei, Hiba, Shino, Neji, her father, Hanabi, Naruto, if you're willing to bet your life on it, then I'm willing to bet mine too. I'm sure you'll do great. It's a small price to pay compared to what you have to go through. Hanada had suddenly remembered, Naruto's healing tag. Suddenly, without ever touching the tag with her, it glowed a gentle green before turning yellow and then suddenly enveloping Hanada in a warm glow. The claw was millimeters away from her head, about to tear her down, when Hanada had acted upon instinct and her body moved. In that mere second instance the golden glow had increased Hanada's reflexes to a degree she had not expected as if it was as fast as her older cousins. 
She had deflected the claw away from her with a resounding arm block that parried the attack away and landing on the ground causing a crater and a small dust cloud. Hanada looked up, gathering chakra to her right arm and expelling it from her tenkatsu on said arm. A form of a lion's head began forming with this magnificent chakra and it turned from yellow to blue, then to purple for a second before going back to blue. The four creatures were surprised. This was Asura's chakra. How on earth? Bayako shouted surprised that such a golden and potent force of chakra had suddenly made its way towards Hanada. What is happening? Why is Asura's chakra with her? The snake shouted surprised. The black tortoise then noticed a certain glow coming from Hanada, a ceiling tag. I see, I never thought it was possible to transfer chakra, especially his chakra into a seal. Isn't this a violation of our sacred ritual? The enraged Suzaku shouted, to him this was a sacrilege. But the blue dragon seemed considerate, we have not placed rules on the rituals we intended to give, Suzaku, so anything is allowed. If we had rules, then we wouldn't be having deaths with this sacred passage. Hanada then cocked her right arm back as she jumped towards the chest of the white tiger. Shishishugeki. Lion palm strike. Boom. A huge cloud of smoke had escaped from the two combatants as the three spectators saw Bayako suddenly sent upwards and slamming to one part of the dome before falling back on the ground as they all stood in surprise. Uh, Bayako grunted. With just one attack, the white tiger was brought to his knees. It had never expected the girl to have been given the blessing of the sage's second son. It did not anticipate such a thing to occur. Asura did not have this ability or on any of the records archived by the Iwagami. Bayako Sama, are you hurt? Hanada approached the white tiger concern written on her face as she knelt down to the tiger. Bayako noticed that most of the girl's wounds were suddenly healed. It felt the girl's chakra and noticed that it was replenishing as well. I have been better, but tell me, how did you obtain the blessing of Asura, the younger son? Hanada suddenly looked embarrassed as she blushed and bowed her head, Naruto-kun is, h he's. The white tiger could tell from the Hyuga's expression and gave a mirthful chuckle, never mind, I have seen from your face what he is to you. If anything else, you have passed my trial. Receive me, dear summoner. The white tiger then began to shrink as it turned back into that small tiger cub from before. I am Bayako, the guardian of the western side of Azumo, white tiger of the west. I am the beast of the wind, born from the tooth of the great Otsutsuki Hamura, receive my power, I recognize you. Outside, the sun was beginning to set, Hanada had not appeared since morning. Everyone outside was getting worried. That is, aside from Naruto and Hanabi who were trading stories to pass the time. Hanabi told Naruto all of the things that she and Hanada had done when they were much younger, like walking with her through the garden, spending time with her at Hanabi's room, reading books and even manga just for her, giving her sweets, everything that loving siblings tend to do. Meanwhile, Naruto remained fascinated to Hanabi's stories, he had always imagined Hinata to be such a great sister, but he never thought that Hanabi idolized her sister ever so dearly. It was then that the portal suddenly pushed Hinata out, she looked a bit dirty and haggard, a few scratches on her hands and holding a small scroll with her. Her jacket was damaged beyond repair, a little dirt and grime caked on her face. But even then, Naruto found her beautiful still. Nay Sama, Hanabi shouted as she dashed to her older sister. Hanada caught Hanabi as the little sister was relieved of her safety, a joyous reunion was then soon followed as Naruto walked towards her, a smile sporting his face. I guess you did it, huh? Naruto said grinning from ear to ear and Hanada nodded. Ah, I see this as the new vessel of Asura Otsutsuki. Naruto was surprised as he was suddenly surrounded by four small-looking summons who were sizing him up. So you were the one who made that ceiling tag. I did not expect someone to have made such a tag to be as young as you. The black tortoise noted as the snake that sprouted on its tail hissed a little and continued. Unexpected but impressive all the same. Um, thank you. Naruto replied in confusion as he suddenly felt something crawling up towards him. A long, Blue and slender lizard then made its way to his shoulders as it played with its whiskers and eyeing Naruto up and down. Indeed, warrior sage of love and courage, whose chakra burns as bright as the sun, beloved by nature, beloved by the air. Okay, what? Naruto asked, suddenly confused by what this creature was talking about. Do not mind Seryu's assessments, the dragon has a love of poetry. 
Naruto noticed a small white tiger cub that Hinata had told him earlier was now sitting in front of him as it waved at him. I see this as the man you consider your mate, Hinata-sama. I would say he is worthy. W wait don't say it like that. W we aren't even married yet. Hinata suddenly stuttered, noticing that the tiger cub had given her a thumbs up. Naruto's jaw hit the ground at this, what's this about marriage? Defiler of our ritual, how dare you lay your hands on our mistress? I will burn you alive and feed your burnt carcass to the fishes at sea. Shouted the red bird as it began pecking on Naruto's head, ducking for his life as he ran around being chased by the red summon. Oni-sama, you're getting married. Hanabi suddenly exclaimed as she could see the sparkles in her eyes. No one is getting married. Hanada shouted as loud as she could. Naruto suddenly had a cold chill down his spine. If Hanada shouted that right now while Jiraiya was in earshot. Naruto, did you get laid? Since when you sneaky little horndog? You have to tell me, for research purposes. Oh god no, not him. Later that evening, just as Hanada and Naruto began packing for their things, they had decided to meet one last time before going back home and much to the disapproval of Ko and Natsu, Hanada still went through with meeting Naruto for the night, now chaperoned by her four new guardians who were watching at a fair distance. They were now just watching just beside the lake, a full moon lighting up the night sky adorned with a multitude of stars. I'm glad they managed to clear that misunderstanding. Naruto said in relief as he sighed and sat down beside Hinata. He was currently wearing a simple orange long sleeve shirt with black sleeves and with no forehead protector. Meanwhile, Hinata was wearing a yukata, a white and silver one that seemed to have been purchased from the town as a recognition of being the heir of the Iwagami clan. Her purple obi wrapped around her waist as she sits daintily beside Naruto also looking up above to the heavens. Did you not want to be married, Naruto-kun? Hinata asked, embarrassed but wanting to know the answer as well. Naruto looked at Hinata in bewilderment and a blush on his face for a second and he answered as he looked up at the moon his eyes then closed, imagining his ideal future, someday, I want that. I want to have a family of my own, a beautiful house, filled with happiness. He imagined, the laughter in that house, he could hear children, I imagine that house so full of life, filled with kids laughing. Going home from work, seeing those kids, my children, smile at me as they run around the house and I get to play with them. I can feel all my worries going away. That sounds wonderful, Hanada commented as she too imagined it smiling as she closed her eyes. She could picture herself with that house, simple yet homely, children running around, their sounds of laughter filling the air. She could almost feel it. Naruto laid down to the grass as he looked up, the gentle waves of the lake seemed to soothe him somewhat. Yeah, really wonderful. A house where I could feel happy, a loving family I never knew about. Hanada then managed to speak. Hey, Naruto-kun. Naruto looked at Hanada who was blushing and looking at him intently. Naruto went back to sitting as Hanada grabbed his hand. Hanada, it was quick and unexpected. Naruto did not realize it yet but Hanada had kissed him again. This time, a little longer than the last. Naruto was about to react when Hanada, gaining a little more bravery, pulled Naruto's arm to her chest. Surprising the blonde so much that he accidentally squeezed and causing Hinata to moan a little. Remember this feeling, Naruto-kun. Remember me always in your journeys. She said as she blushed kissing him again before she let him go and rested her head on his shoulders. Naruto meanwhile was blushing so much that his mouth was hanging open, unnoticed by Hinata. W when did Hinata get big there? I'm going home tonight. We will be taking the long way home. I want to see some things before I get back to Konoha. I heard Jiraiya-sama is taking you to Uzushiogakur. Naruto only gave a nod and a grunt, answering Hanada only a speechless and horny teenager can. I'm always thinking about you and always praying for your safety. Hanada, yes, you're the best girlfriend ever. Silly, Naruto-kun, I'm your only girlfriend. Another kiss. She then left after a few more minutes, Naruto was still standing there, mouth agape, still in shock. Jiraiya came in a few minutes later and the old man grinned. Never knew she had it in her. Naruto silently looked his right hand intently and in reflex, squeezed it a little as Jiraiya looked at the boy and said, she let you cop a feel, didn't she? Arrow Senen. Grass Country. So this is Canopy Bridge. Sasuke mentioned as the wind blew slightly towards them at one end of the bridge that connected them to two large cliff faces. 
Kakashi had told his team of Kanabi Bridge on the way towards their designated point. It was here that one of his clansmen perished. A shinobi who gave his treasured eyes to his friend as a parting gift to keep them safe. To an Uchiha, it may have been foolish. But having traditions now lay dead, he thought that it was the noblest sacrifice one could ever give. His name was Obito. His Sharingan that I carry now is the pact I've gotten, in exchange for his life, to keep Rin safe. Kakashi mentioned as he finally closed his book and looked down as they crossed the reconstructed bridge. But even Rin died. She was a victim of the war that turned men and women into monsters. She was a kind soul that Obito loved, dearly. But I failed him with that too. Kakashi mentioned as they finally made it to the end of the bridge. Sakura nodded. She had an inkling that the mission they had right now brought back memories that Kakashi did not want to remember. She surmised that Kakashi had been carrying this pain for quite a while and his description of this event in detail brought forth a near-detached narration of Kakashi's exploits here. She noticed that their sensei was also speaking in a deprecating mood, meaning the trauma had yet to heal. She had concluded that Kakashi's mantra of staying with your comrades must have started here and experienced a trauma so great that he hadn't been able to let go after years of keeping it within himself. She looked at their new teammate, Sai, who was looking like he was seeing everything with a calculated look. The boy had noticed immediately and gave a smile that creeped her out. It was not Naruto that was with them this time, yet Kakashi was telling them such a personal story. I'm telling you this because, Although I have said that our comrades come first, this is also a lesson in what happens when you put your objectives first without thinking through. My decision cost me a friend and that line of trauma also never got away, it encroached me until Rin died as well. Kakashi Sensei. Sakura was about to say something until Sasuke spoke to him, I get it now. Why you you stopped me that time, because you had this Obito person with you. He loved our village much as he loved Rin. Kakashi smiled beneath his mask, yes, in fact, Obito wanted to be Hokage. He, really loved everyone in it as much as he loved Rin, most of all. Yet he gave his life for the mission, did he not? I would say that his sacrifice brought forth safety for the village. I do not see why we should mourn for that. Sai had replied, emotionally detached, his smile brought forth something that would have come off as mockery to anyone, but Kakashi, being the captain, let it slide. It was true. Sakura scowled at Sai and admonished him, Sai. Sasuke did not react personally, but he looked at Sai with as much apathy as he could. Kakashi had warned them of this boy's affiliations, a subordinate of a dubious organization, one who did not answer to the Hokage but rather an independent unit. He did not know if such a unit would be advisable to have in Konoha, because he thought that having that much power certainly will not give the Hokage any favors. The Sandame Hokage had to have some form of leash or else, this group could organize a coup big enough to cause civil unrest within the village or stage one at that. That he did. That's why I try not to make his death useless. Obito remains alive with me. Kakashi replied, also smiling. Obito died for them. Died happily and willingly, died as a shinobi worthy of being a hero. Obito was Konoha's hero. So you're the delegates that Konoha has sent for this investigation, huh? One of the Kusa Nin had spoken, the quartet immediately stopped as Kakashi nodded. The daimyo of grass country had to outsource this mission because of manpower, most of us are stuck doing border duty as of late. Kakashi then added, yes, our information network has noticed an increase in border activity near rain country. There are worrisome reports indicating of aim sending ninjas near their borders all around and shinobi had been mobilizing out of reaction. Still, I hope nothing happens and no incident occurs. One of the Kusa Nin nodded, that's true. We'd never been this tense since the start of the third war. I don't want to have to live through that again. Bunch of cowards, don't you think? Sai quipped, the two shinobi in front of them scowled at the boy's remark but it went ignored by the boy as he continued, conflict is inevitable. War will happen to those who have no qualms in pursuing conflict. And as soldiers, we must not have that hesitation when it comes to war. After all, life is cheap especially ours, is it no? Sai was suddenly cut off when Sakura had decked him hard enough that he was sent skidding on the ground. Don't you dare talk about our lives like that as if it's meaningless, you asshole. It brought a sore spot on Team 7 when a topic like this was brought up. That moment in Wave was all they could remember. And that mission changed them completely.
Sasuke turned to Sakura and held her shoulder with his hand, his silent presence telling her to calm down. Calm down, Sakura. Sasuke then turned to Sai and walked towards his direction. You have a sharp tongue and you have only resorted to insults all on the way here and you keep destroying team dynamics with your words throughout this whole trip. Sasuke mentioned as he stopped just right before their new teammate. What's your actual goal? Sasuke asked, his Sharingan blaring to life as he stared at Sai who avoided his gaze in immediate reflex. If Sasuke was surprised, he didn't show it, opting instead to let the agent do his own thing as the Uchiha observed him. To have that much reflexes was a testament to severe Anbu training probably longer than he had. This type of experience was unnatural even for his own age. I am merely occupying the empty spot for your teammate. Sai replied, his smile never wavered but it was obvious that he was not looking at Sasuke directly. Listen up. Sasuke then brandished his sword and pointed the tip towards Sai. Much like you, I have no intentions of getting close to you. Team 7 is made up of me, Sakura, Naruto and Kakashi is our captain. Being part of this team means that you have to adapt to how we do things. We do not have to adjust to yours. I do not trust you, not one bit. Especially if you don't even. Sasuke. That's enough. Kakashi interrupted him. Sasuke turned to his teacher and grunted as he placed his sword to its sai quietly. Kakashi turned to the two Kusa ninja as he said, I deeply apologize for my subordinate, he's new and he has very poor social graces when it comes to things like this. The two KUSA nin looked at each other and nodded as one of them replied to Kakashi, so long as you keep that putrid mouth of his shut, I've no intention of blowing this up. It's bad enough we're all on edge. Besides, that girl with the pink hair already laid the smackdown on that pretty boy. Too bad she didn't intentionally break the man's jaw. Chapter 24. Inheritors Part 1. Kiba woke up, a feeling of heaviness taking over him as he got up to sit. He felt his head spinning as if everything was hazy. He looked around, holding his head. He had blacked out, what had exactly happened? One moment he was standing before Yeba, the next, he was in unimaginable pain. I see you're awake. You've been out for three days. Kiba looked around. He was still within what he would call as a shrine to the Chikusuki no Buso, a relic carried even before the era of the warring clans. Kiba groaned at this, he couldn't remember what happened. Somebody got that bull that ran me over. Fucking hell this hurts. Kiba swore he noticed his left arm, his sleeves were now with a written kanji of the word, blade, near the elbow like a tattoo. Strange. Did somebody spike his water or something? Bewildered, the youngest Inazuka looked around and noticed Akamaru was resting near the dais, wearing what he could tell was some light-weighted armor and a pair of greaves on his partner's forearms. They were sleek and metallic, possibly steel, but they covered the forelegs enough that Akamaru's movements wouldn't be hindered but provided some form of protection still. That and he noted that Akamaru suddenly got bigger. About as big as the Inagami but not enough to reach the size of Yeba, who was about the size of a small horse. Young Akamaru had managed to bond with Chikusuki no Buso and as a result, a weapon was given to him. Yeba answered with a smirk. Kiba shook his head to snap himself out of his days and the Inagami patriarch laughed. That's right, pup, sharpen your senses. You are now the official warrior of the Inagami. What? Kiba asked in confusion as Yeba answered him, you see, the way that we work with our summoner is different from most of the other summons. You can summon us and also, make a replica of our weapons with you with the help of Chikusuki no Buso. The orb provides weapons for us and in due time, if you have endured enough, you will be recognized by the orb as worthy and obtain your own weapon as well. Yeba then shuffled for a second and tossed the sheathed blade at his left side upwards as he caught the blade by its handle. Each weapon is unique to us when we apply chakra to it. My weapon lets me conceal my presence to a point that I can become hidden from all senses. This blade is silent and when swung, it does not vibrate in the air to make a sound. With this, even the sound of your breath vanishes and your footsteps concealed. It's why I call this Musei Setsudan Ki, silent cutting machine. Kiba whistled as he eagerly asked, so how do I do that? Yeba grinned as he tossed the blade upwards with practiced ease and caught it with the sheath and safely locked the blade. It's easy. Just draw some blood and smear it on your forearm to wear the character of the weapon as and call upon it on your arm. The jutsu is called, Migi Buso, Yeba, left arm armament, blade. Kiba did as he was instructed, 
he bit his thumb right thumb and smeared his blood on to the character and flicked his left hand. Migi Buso. Yeba, left arm armament. Blade. In a poof of smoke, an exact copy of Yeba's blade appeared in his hands. Kiba had not exactly noticed earlier, but the Inazuka soon appreciated the blade in his hand. It was almost silver in color on the blade itself a single-edged slender-looking blade. The blade was about six inches in length that was straight in its shape unlike those of a wakazashi. Going to the base, Kiba noted a metal ring formed just below the blade itself and downwards to the handle, he noted that it was made of very sturdy wood, smoothened out very well that no splinters could ever harm his hand. I've only noticed it now, but Yeba san, your knife is pretty well made. Kiba mentioned as he held the weapon higher and testing out its use. Despite the ring, it seemed sturdy enough to withstand almost anything. Of course, I wouldn't have it any other way, pup. Yeba then went towards the resting Akamaru and gently woke the Ninkan. I suppose this is where your training shall end for now. The Inagami then pointed its snout towards another part of the tree just beyond the stone dais of the Chikusuki no Buso. Take that scroll, write your blood in it as our contract and set off back home. Your clan must be starting to grow weary of your absence. There's also some robes for you to wear before you get back. Well, more like pelts, they are made from the hides of the animals you have participated in hunting. It is a symbol of our pact. Akamaru then stood up and yipped as he wagged his tail for Kiba. This pilgrimage thing was definitely worth it. Konoha. Nara Shikamaru, Chunin and budding tactical advisor, was quietly finishing his paperwork for the day and was about to head out. It had been a while since he had finished early and noticed that he was getting faster and faster in managing his time in the office. He had no idea how much paperwork was involved upon being a Chunin and working at the administration of Konoha's central command while his peers were sent throughout the field. He could still do missions, but Shikaku had him here more often than not. His idle time was spent here looking at papers, coordinating with logistics, sometimes assigning missions to different teams. It turned out that it was just as hectic here as it was when on missions but at least field work definitely did not have the grinding insanity of monotony. He sighed as he did some neck stretches. He didn't know why his father had recommended him to start work here immediately but he had a guess. As he observed that his processing information and deductive reasoning had gotten better and that his decision-making ability had been quicker as of late. He had noticed it during in his missions too. He only needed to read a mission briefing was and before any encounters if there ever was one, had already formulated a plan just in case. He had noticed his shogi matches with his father were getting longer too. Back then it only took Shikaku merely half an hour to beat his son. But now, it took Shikaku an hour and a half to finally dismantle his strategy. He didn't look like an upstart now. Finished already, speaking of the devil, Shikamaru turned around and saw his old man with a smile on his face and two scrolls in his hands. Shikamaru nodded. I am. It only took me two hours to finish this much work now. I'm surprised by myself of how much work I got done and not just go out and sleep under a tree to laze around. The weather is perfect for it too. Shikaku chuckled, you and me both, son. Shikaku then handed Shikamaru one of the scrolls in his hands as he then proceeded to his own desk. He knew Shikamaru was lying to stay in character. He had noticed him training on the free time that he had, not only just lazing around. It was a fact that his unmotivated child did not like training at all, but after the events that had transpired and learning to grow a little, Shikamaru was forced to realize that there are things that he simply just couldn't ignore. His mind would waste if he did not improve and it was why Shikaku had to be subtle in helping his son improve in the smallest of ways. It was why he was assigned in the administrative affairs and logistics coordination within the village to train Shikamaru and familiarize himself with a much more proactive approach in planning. It was no secret that sifting through information and organizing it to come up with a concrete strategy is a monumental task and Shikamaru, being a promising tactician and strategist, would inevitably be held responsible in that regard as part of Tsunade's plan for the foreseeable future and beyond after Shikaku's retirement. In fact, she was relying on Shikaku to implement this part of their long-term strategy. They cannot have a repeat of lacking shinobi in the face of crisis after crisis as it did starting at the Kayubi's attack all the way up to the invasion and the appearance of Akatsuki in their borders just a few years prior. In this regard, Shikaku had realized, even under prosperity, even with the guidance of their longest reigning cage, 
Konoha had lost many prodigious shinobi untimely due to certain events and that war was never far from their doorstep. Shikaku didn't want to admit it, but Danzo was right on that front. But his methods and his organization were problematic in accordance with diplomacy. Being a militarized village, no matter how powerful, peace should always be the first option because war was a drain on resources. It was why Konoha redoubled their efforts, stricter training methods were applied, reformed curriculums and retraining shinobi became the first priority in Tsunade's reign and the results speak for themselves. The Junin received a new member in their ranks, courtesy of Hayuga Neji, the genius of the Hayuga clan. A branch member that had the talent to learn their clan jutsu uninstructed was such a curve ball that it threw everyone for a loop, destroying all preconceived notions of the branch family as nothing more than meat shields for the main family. The Anbu had received a boon in Uchiha Sasuke, a budding talent the likes of which would be seen only once in a generation. His skill and prowess already propelling him high through the ranks, with Tsunade and the rest of the council considering him ready to be Junin in a short amount of time. The medics got Haruno Sakura, a clan less Kunoichi who hailed from simple merchants with a mind that was as gifted as Senju Tsunade herself. A practical genius in medicine that was starting to make waves in the village. Tsunade had nothing but praise for her student who ate her lectures so quick that she only needs to explain a theory once in a scroll for the details and Sakura can train with almost unneeded supervision. And from what he could gather, specialists were receiving more applicants and passing them without ever lowering their standards as well. The intelligence division has reported of Inoichi having put his daughter under his wing while also learning from the medic division and also Anko having to teach Inoichi's daughter the ropes inside their unit along with Ibiki. It made Ino queasy at first, but eventually found her talents of the mind as something else. So much so that Kurenai, their premier genjutsu specialist, took interest as well. From the letters that Shikaku could gather and with help of the cryptologists, Jiraiya's coded messages had also revealed another budding talent that made all of the adult shinobi excited too. Uzumaki Naruto was reported to show an ungodly amount of talent in Puenjutsu who tested theories more often than not that most of the seals that Jiraiya were reporting were not only unorthodox, but extremely innovative as well, able to function not just for containment but for different purposes as well. The boy was nothing but full of surprises, whatever measuring stick that they had for him did not simply keep up. Somehow, that cloud of uncertainty that loomed over Konoha's future started drifting away. Shikaku smiled. This new generation was blazing a trail for the future. He had never seen so much talent in just one group. Shikaku was happy to say the least that the future had never looked brighter. Maybe he and the rest of the adults were flawed, but the nurture of their future was turning out better than what they have been. This was what the Sandame wanted to see. Or perhaps, Hiruzen already saw it and he was happy just to get a glimpse of that potential and that he died knowing that these new leaves will be the foundation that will keep the village strong. Dad, is there something you want me to do? Shikamaru asked him, pulling him out of his thoughts as he looked at his son and then back to his desk, two scrolls still there on top of his table, unopened. Right, I want you to take one of these scrolls. Shikaku handed one over to Shikamaru. His son accepted the scroll. This contains a list of theories concerning our specialty. Shadow manipulation techniques aren't flashy and there's no need for it to be, but it's nice to have options for better survivability. How goes your Doden training and your training with Rado? Shikamaru raised his eyebrow at this, it's fine, learning Doden isn't such a pain as I anticipated but Rado sensei's training with that black sword can be grueling at times. Shikamaru, as a present for passing the Chunin exams for the first time, was gifted with a short sword courtesy of Asuma, his Junin sensei and a weapon specialist. The son of the Sandame was kind enough to endorse him to Rado another weapon specialist, a master of the black sword style that emphasized on sneak attacks and disabling poison that can go by unnoticed. It was one of the reasons why he was assigned as one of the fourth Hokage's bodyguards and due to Shikamaru being groomed as one of the people privy to the Hokage's work, it seemed fit for Shikamaru to be trained by Rado. Shikaku had to admit, Shikamaru barely needed guidance to advance his ability to execute his jutsu, but the compliments that Shikamaru had put to his shadow-based jutsu made him more dangerous. A shadow user that can extend his range by manipulating the earth beneath him and performing sneak attacks with near undetectable skill laced with poison. Add that to Asuma's report of Shikamaru's quiet soundless and quick sunshine ability. That's a skill set that anybody should fear, it was like Shikamaru was built with assassination in mind. You're going to train, right? 
Do mind the jutsu you try to come up with. I bought you a journal at home, at least try to write down your progress. Maybe the theories the scroll presents you can become proven. Shikamaru nodded. I'll keep that in mind. With that, Shikamaru was off. Shikaku never then opened the remaining scroll. A few silent seconds came by and the man stood up and went running to the Hokage's office. Fire Country Border. Man, border duty can be so boring. Hey Shino, can you tell me some really exciting stories from your village? A tan girl asked from behind as Shino had been walking with hands in his pockets. Shino seemed a bit irritated of this girl inwardly, but he didn't seem to mind her presence. She reminded him of Kiba, only a girl version of him, though. It had been three days since he had performed his first Kuchio's no jutsu and in that three days, Shino was beginning to think that summoning was not worth the headache. It took him three hours of wasted time just convincing that red beetle of his credentials as a member of the Abarame clan and three hours more just to learn how much chakra he was going to need in summoning the rest of the beetle's clansmen. It all sounded so horrendously annoying that the red beetle kept shouting in his ear like an annoying pet, that it agitated even his colony. On the plus side, perhaps he made a friend. He couldn't tell. Fu was an excitable person and it may be due ruse to get him to trust her. But it was never a negative to know a person for him. Fu, where the hell have you been? What are you doing on that side of the border? A voice had called out. Fu who had been happily looking around as Shino walked suddenly look elated and waved, Shibuki. How are ya? What took you guys so long? Shino stopped for a second. Where had he heard that name before? He looked back and saw a boy probably a bit older than him, with long black hair reaching to the nape of his neck, wearing some dull red clothing and some leather braces for his torso and arms and grey pants, the insignia of Takigakur no Sato was etched on his forehead protector. I decided to wander around and meet new people. Fu grinned and pointed to the Konoha Shinobi in front of her. Konoha Shinobi? Shibuki asked, raising an eyebrow. Shino could detect no hostility in his voice and then turned around. I am Abarame Shino of the Abarame clan. I was sent here to do border patrol duty by the Hokage. Fu san has been accompanying me for three days, hiding and sleeping in the woods at night and meeting with me during the day. She's been with me these three days and has been informing me that she was keeping in touch. I suppose she's been lying about that if you have been searching for her all this time. Shino said as he adjusted his sunglasses while glaring at Fu who was looking away and trying to act innocent as if she just lied to his face for three whole days. Shibuki looked at Fu with a glare and then back at Shino with a bow. I'm sorry for the trouble she has caused you and I thank you for taking care of her. He then grabbed Fu by the head and forced her to bow as well at Shino. There is no problem. Fu has been quite friendly and she has been behaving well enough. Although I would advise trying to keep an eye on her from now on, she can be quite flighty. She may cause an incident we do not want on both our villages if she's not careful. Fu seemed to pout at this as Shibuki nodded with a smile, it's the second time we have been helped by Konoha Shinobi. My thanks for your hospitality and indulging my subordinate. Shino gave a nod as Shibuki then began lecturing Fu. I let you go and be out for just one mission and you go running of on your own. Fu flinched at this but replied, it's not like the guys you tried to lump me with were friendly. They ignored me the whole way and they kept acting like I didn't matter. Shibuki shook his head at this, I'm sorry about that, but you need to understand your place too, Fu. You're an important part of our village, we can't just let you go whenever you want to. Not when I just received news of Akatsuki. Shino stopped at this, Akatsuki. Shibuki seemed to stop at this as well, he turned to Shino and said, we may be on friendly terms, Shino-san. But Akatsuki is business meant for our village, we hope you understand. Shino, knowing what the Akatsuki were after, merely feigned ignorance. He nodded. It was safe to assume that Fu was something of a target for the mysterious organization in the same vein Naruto was, a Jinchiriki, he concluded. It is better that I stay low and do not make any more moves to press for information. Fu will be safer knowing that she assumes that I know nothing. Information like this are supposed to be secret. So in order not to cause any more problems, Shino had to walk away. I will not press for further information. Fu turned to Shino looking down and looking apologetic, or rather, seemingly sad. I'm sorry, Shino, I lied because I just didn't want to go back yet. I just don't want you to hate me for being a little selfish. Shino gave a nod, it is of no consequence. 
If you feel that you need someone to talk to, I will be here for a few more weeks until I get back. If you wish to talk to me, then at least trust your comrades like Shibuki-san and have them support you when you are at the border. It would put all of us at ease knowing you wouldn't try to escape again. This seemed to cheer Fu up and smiled at Shino, okay. Fu went ahead back to Taki's border as Shibuki bowed once again, I thank you for that. It seems Fu desperately wanted someone to talk to, though I can see that you aren't much of a talker yourself, Shino-san. Shino shook his head, I only talk when I need to, Shibuki-san, I don't usually need to when someone else can do it for me. Comrades and friends do not need to talk to convey their feelings. Keeping Fu company is the least I could do. Already considering her your friend, Shino-san. Shibuki asked with a smile, Fu was a lonely girl most of the time and having friends definitely staved off that loneliness. It helped to have her talk out her emotions even if that person was quiet enough. Just knowing someone was willing to listen was enough for her. Shino gave a nod, despite my nature, I am not averse to having friends. I am used to that seeing as I have comrades who are just as energetic. Shibuki then asked as he grinned, so you know Naruto-san, then. Shino raised an eyebrow at this, I suppose. Then could you tell him that I said hi. His team was responsible in helping me in my village. I can't thank them enough. I will. With that, Shibuki gave a bow and left the area to give chase to Fu once again before heading back. Shino could not help but smile a little. It seems his friends were worth something to fight for too. Grass country. The four Konoha shinobi and the two Kusa shinobi had managed to find a path down from the cliffs of the plateau reaching down. By nightfall, they had arrived at the bottom and noted how far up the bridge was from what they were looking at. Three days had passed from their hiking, they made a small pit stop at the nearby VL Lage near the path that would take them downwards on the first day and the remaining two days was spent on walking this path downwards and the villagers explained that something or someone had been creeping down at the base of this plateau and was somewhat disturbing the peace. The villagers were a superstitious lot, they were describing the person as a ghost-like entity, entering the place and then vanishing like a ghost. We'll make camp here. We'll be investigating by tomorrow morning. Sakura, will you take first watch? Kakashi asked and Sakura nodded as they all began pitching up their tents for the night while Sasuke began looking for firewood. As night started, Sasuke looked on at the place they were supposed to start the investigation. He could feel something coming out of that cave, something different, as if anything that he might see in that cave would make him uncomfortable and on edge. I have to be extra careful tomorrow. Before turning in for the night and having his fill of dinner, Sasuke kept staring at the cave, his eyes continued to stare at the opening and held his mother's sword close to him at all times. There was definitely something there. Of what, he wouldn't know, but the feeling was there. Sasuke-kun. Sasuke was brought out of his musings as Sakura stood behind him, he turned to look at his teammate as she spoke, I'm taking first watch, remember. Get some rest, you'll be taking over once I'm done. Sasuke nodded wordlessly as he got up but not before looking back at the entrance of the small cave for a second before turning back, Sakura was immediate to notice this, is something bothering you? No, I just don't like what I'm feeling from that cave. Sakura looked on in wonder and then asked, what makes you think that? Nothing, it's just I, Sasuke gripped his mother's sword tighter, I feel a cold wind from that place, as if it's warning me that if I go in there, I might see something I wouldn't like. Sakura was silent at this as Sasuke walked back to his tent to get some sleep. Sakura glanced at the cave and frowned. What has put Sasuke on edge? Whatever it is, she had to be on better guard. There was no telling what may happen if even Sasuke was on edge. It seems Sasuke-kun has changed a lot since being part of this team. She observed, a smile slowly developing on her face. Sasuke could hardly be called a sociable child. He used to be but the trauma of his family and his clan's massacre had tragically changed him into a recluse. He, turned into something that Sakura had finally accepted as something that wasn't positive at all. He was dismissive and thought of their classmates for the worst. There were times that he would seem antagonistic and his blunt ways of telling others rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. She had to admit that her previous thought of Sasuke's dismissive attitude were cool at first but once they became teammates, his words were scalding and hurtful and in his bluntness, Sakura was slapped with the truth that she seemed to ignore in their early days. 
She had promised to herself to never be left behind by her teammates and it was a promise that she intends to keep to this day. And with what they have been through, Sakura understood a little of how Sasuke acted and behaved. Sasuke was a boy whose love was taken away harshly, his parents' lives cut short. He did not show his fears, but as she got to know him, as they all got closer, his fears were wordlessly shown with the way he acts and the way he treated others. He pushed other people away so that they wouldn't needlessly be involved with his sordid affairs. Sasuke has survivor's guilt and it ate away at his mind for so long. What scared him the most was the fact that people will die if they ever got close to him and it was why he found it hard to open up to them. The same could be said for their blonde teammate, but Naruto's own way of expressing himself to ward out his depression could be just as destructive, the way he hid his own pain to himself by acting like a fool. But Sakura had sooner realized that Naruto now has Hinata for those moments of vulnerability, he was able to confide in her as much as he could confide with Aruka and even Jiraiya. Sasuke. He had no one other than their team. Maybe it was why Naruto's stubborn attitude worked on Sasuke, because if anyone could be more hard-headed than Sasuke, it was Naruto, his friend, his rival and his teammate. But even then, there were moments that even with Naruto's brightness and overall attitude there will be times where Sasuke could never say what he needed to say in front of his teammate. They were friends, but Sasuke, needs someone who can put his mind at ease even with when there were moments that Sasuke preferred solitude. But now, at least he was opening up even if a little. Perhaps the cold shoulder treatment did work on him months ago when he decided to do things on his own again. That and how his trust issues have improved, I guess by the leaps and bounds that Sasuke-kun has shown, it's only right that he can share his fears with me, even if it's just a little. Sakura was glad, Sasuke had allowed himself to be a little vulnerable, even to her. Several hours passed, and Sasuke was the first to go to Sakura's spot and gently nudged her. It's my turn to take watch. Sakura turned to him and gave a small grin, thanks, Sasuke-kun. Sasuke looked puzzled at this as she gave him a smile, don't try to think hard about it. Just take my gratitude and do as you do. We're right behind you. Sasuke gave her a little smile as he sat down to his watch and said, get some rest. I will. Anagami Shrine. A cloud of smoke popped into existence as Kiba and Akamaru were transported back into the shrine at dawn. Kiba stretched his arms and his legs as he grinned, finally able to go home. The thought of his bed made him giddy with excitement, he could relax for a few days and gloat to his mother that he rediscovered the old Anagami contract. Kiba was now wearing his jacket with a torn sleeve on his left arm, showing the seal engraved there like a tattoo, a large tiger pelt took over half of his torso on the left as his right was his black leather jacket. It was bound together by a large leather belt bound on his waist and buckled snugly. He wore a pair of shin guards that were covered up by two pairs of pelts similarly patterned as the one on his jacket. It's finally time to set home, huh, boy. Akamaru yipped. He noticed his partner's lightweight red-colored armor seemed to have fit his partner. Once again, this whole pilgrimage thing is totally worth it. Kiba and Akamaru began their long trek home. By mid-afternoon, they were soon near the Uchiha warehouse that he traveled with Sasuke. Kiba's nose twitched for a second. He could smell the faint smell of iron, blood, and body odor. The pattern was similar when his team had been sent to dispatch these people. Bandits. Kiba growled as he motioned for Akamaru, let's go, boy. Akamaru barked as he too growled at Kiba's command, preparing himself as his master without a moment of hesitation. As they ran, they finally see that the bandits, eight of them, had surrounded a familiar figure. It was that girl from the warehouse with her cat. Kiba bit his right thumb and drew blood and swiped it on the character of, Blade. Migi Buso. Yeba. Left hand armament. Blade. With a flick of his wrist, he deployed the ringed knife from his person, and in the process let Akamaru take charge. The dog was quick on his feet and with the help of his armor, boosted his speed that Akamaru had made a fast stride quick enough to intercept one of the bandits. Tamaki turned around, her ninja cat was on full alert. She noticed one of the brigands were taken down by a large creature. She was quick to notice it was a dog. Just then, said bandit was suddenly slashed down by the throat drawing blood and instantly killing the man by something she couldn't tell. There was another here, but that person's presence couldn't be felt. Kiba was spinning the knife in his hand by the ring before he crouched low, made quick stabs in the gut, 
before severing some of the crook's flesh on his arm, Kiba had noted he had hit something important if the massive flow of blood gushing out was an invitation. That guy fell down to the ground, not immediately lifeless, bleeding on the earth beneath Kiba's feet. Shit. Ah. One of the bandits had no chance to announce anything when Akamaru had suddenly appeared in midair and bit the man on the throat and crushing the said man's windpipe as Akamaru then spun the man and slammed him the ground. What the fuck is going on here? Kiba then deactivated the flow of chakra to his knife. I should be asking that question here. Kiba asked, revealing himself as he sat on a dying man spinning the knife in his left hand by the ring. How did you? Tamaki was about to ask as Kiba grinned, from their scent, I could tell they were bandits, their smell is common for the blood and rusting iron as well as that familiar body odor indicating no proper hygiene because they can't get near a well-defended village or they are running from the law. I have to ask you guys that you're persistent, I can tell you that much. Nobody asked you, buddy. One of the bandits then launched an arrow at Kiba who grinned as Akamaru appeared out of nowhere and caught the arrow mid-flight, his partner growled at the men as Kiba's smirk never left his face. Hey, I remember you, you came with my cousin, right? Sasuke. Tamaki seemed to recall as Kiba got up and tossed the knife in midair before performing a set of hand signs and ending it with the seal at the tiger. Kaden. Hausenka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Mythical Fire Flower Technique. A barrage of small red flames escaped Kiba's mouth as two of the brigands were suddenly enveloped in red-hot flames, burning them and forcing them on the ground. Names Kiba, Inazuka Kiba. Kiba said as he caught the knife and disappeared from her eyes, his presence suddenly vanished. Stab. One of the bandits was suddenly skidding back as Kiba appeared in front of him knife held reverse as he used free right hand to push the hilt of the knife further into the man's chest before disappearing. The man fell over dead as Kiba pulled the knife out of his chest. Akamaru snapped the arrow in half with his fangs and rushed to one of the bandits at blinding speeds and slashed at his target with his armored claws. Kiba noted that the armor, despite that it should be weighing down his partner, actually enhanced Akamaru's speed. We can't let them get all the glory, Tama-chan. We can do this too. Ninpo. Nako Sum. The cat ninja jumped and scratched a bandit's face as Tamaki then went ahead and used Sunshin, appearing in front of one bandit crouching and twisting around kicking the criminal by the chin as he was launched upwards. That's Konoha's taijutsu technique. Konoha shofuu, leaf rising wind. Kiba was surprised that someone from outside his village knew the technique and proper positioning for that attack to work. Tamaki then seemed to gather chakra on her legs and feet and jumped towards her victim and suddenly changed trajectory when Kiba heard something close to pushing compressed air out. Tama-chan. The cat then tapped on its scarf and out came from the smoke were a pair of four long blades of handheld weapons, the cat then kicked the weapons in midair and sent them to Tamaki who caught them with her hands surprisingly in less than a second as Tamaki changed trajectory once again when Kiba heard another sound of compressed air escaping the air. Teko Kagi. That's a weird weapon to use. It was then that Kiba saw their effectiveness as Tamaki began wailing on her opponent and noticed that the blades were raking the flesh of her victim and changing trajectories again before she finally appeared midair and performed an excel kick on her opponent in the face sending the poor soul down on the ground and a dust cloud began forming. Kiba turned around and saw two of the assailants attacked him as the cat now named Tama touched his bandana again and a set of shuriken came flying hitting one man and staggering back as Kiba took care of another by blocking the oncoming slash at him. Unfortunately for the man this allowed Kiba to grant him an opening now that his right hand was free to form any action he could take. Kiba grinned maliciously as he punched the man by the gut. The man staggered back a little as Akamaru now appeared beside Kiba. Kiba then run with his dog before he spun around and slashing one man by the hands as his presence vanished once more and Akamaru doing the same, shredding their opponents in quick fashion. Tamaki was about to attack the last bandit but that man decided the better part of valor and resorted to retreating. Tamaki then went to him as she said with a pout, you know I could have handled that on my own, right? Kiba shrugged, seemed like the best way to deal with them quicker that way. You help whenever you can and wherever you can. That's a pack rule, after all. The girl responded with a laugh and said, I suppose, I'm Tamaki by the way, thanks for your help, Kiba. Tamaki. Huh. The cat then meandered its way to Tamaki and gave a short, meow, as its form of thanks and raising its right paw. Wow. Tama-chan doesn't look like she's afraid of Akamaru there. Kiba noted as he glanced down at the cat and then looked up at Tamaki. 
She's a smart cat. But Akamaru seems like a well-trained Ninkan, he doesn't bark at Tama-chan at all. She said excitedly as Kiba seemed to boast about it. I'm his trainer after all. He's a smart one, for sure. Kiba then gave a haughty laugh. As if to emphasize his point, Akamaru gently moved his left forepaw and waited for Tama to high-five the dog's paw with her own. Kiba petted Akamaru's head at that and Akamaru seemed to have given Kiba a metaphorical thumbs up. As if to say, I'm your best goddamn wingman here, and if you get this girl to go with you, you owe me a sack of treats when we get back. Kiba gave his partner a thumbs up as Kiba cried rivers of tears, you're the best, boy. He was so spoiling Akamaru if he manages to get with this girl. So what were you doing out here? Kiba asked as he let Akamaru do his thing, namely, starting to dig holes around and disposing the dead bodies. I was thinking of going to Konoha to buy some things for grandma and me and maybe see some of the shinobi there. My grandma said my cousin gets pretty lonely sometimes so maybe I'll pay him a visit too. Score. Kiba thought as he inwardly jumped. Akamaru however, gave a growl as if telling Kiba, do not fuck this up. Well, that's a coincidence, I was just about to head home as well. Want to make this interesting and run at our pace. Loser has to treat the winner at the market. Tamaki looked thoughtful for a second as she looked for her ninbyo, Tama-chan. Said cat only looked at her before grooming herself. All right, let's do this. Tamaki shouted looking fired up as she ran off followed by Tama-chan. Kiba soon followed along with Akamaru. Eastern sea just at the coast of fire country. Naruto looked on at the sea, this was it. They were going to Uzushiogakur. Jiraiya made a promise to himself and to Kashina's grave that one day, he was going to take Naruto to the desolate land of his ancestors as a way to know his legacy. It was something Naruto had been wondering for a while. What was the purpose of going to Uzushiogakur, a long dead village that only housed nothing but destruction? Because you need to see for yourself, the aftermath of hatred. Asura spoke to him, it had been a while since they had a conversation, no doubt not disturbing him to let him have his peace for a while was his goal. Being revealed to the Hyuga clan did not exactly mean favor to them. It only painted a large target on their backs. Especially now in the era of great villages, carnage can start at the most ridiculous of reasons. You speak of sentiments, Ashura. Let this boy see it for what it is and he will change. To speak highly of this fool is an insult. Yeah fuck you too, Kurama. As the ship set sailed, Jiraiya was at his side and the man looked worried for a sec. That damned report. Are you telling me that Onoki has been missing for three days? And he just appeared, looking worse for wear but somehow floating his way to his office with no presence of his bodyguards and granddaughter. Roshi and Han are also missing. Jiraiya needed to confirm more. Earth country's suspicious activities cannot be ignored, he needed to find more answers. Before he could meet up with the blonde, Jiraiya made correspondent letters between his spies in Iowa and then to Tsunade with an advice to warn nearby countries adjacent to them, particularly Wind Country. The last war had not eased the hatred that existed between Tsuna and Iowa, but he sure as hell will not be sleeping this over to prevent another goddamn war. He hoped to the high heavens that Naruto's generation would never experience war, it had killed so many people and broken many more. No one was the same after a war, it was a nightmare to think about. After finishing his letters and sending them all into their respective destinations via messenger toads, Jiraiya had decided he had done all he can to try and prevent this. He looked onto the deck and saw Naruto sitting down and staring outward into the vast sea. Everything doing fine, Naruto asked. Jiraiya, rather than sparing him from the harsh truth, sighed and sat down beside his student. Asura was right, children they may be, but he needed to respect Naruto's ability to understand. No matter how young he was, Jiraiya sat beside his student as both of them stared out into the ocean in front of them, the sound of the waters gently crashing onto their vessel was all that was heard until Jiraiya gave a sigh in exhaustion. No, everything isn't fine, kid. There are things moving around the continent that is worrisome right now, but I don't know which is worse. Something going on in Earth Country. Or something going on in AIM. And yet no news of Akatsuki's activity for three days or at least, no activity within their borders. Jiraiya dismissed that for a moment as Konoha has been actively sweeping the country for any sightings of Akatsuki. Tsunade seemed very determined to throw Konoha's power to bear against the organization as much as she was willing to throw it at Orochimaru's face. 
Naruto looked worried at this. What was the significance of Iwa's movements that had caught the radar of Konoha's spy master? These are changing times, kid. But I promise you, I'm doing every ounce of my energy to prevent a war. I just hope that my decisions are correct. I don't want you suffering the same fate as us in this perpetual world of violence. If possible, I want to change that. Naruto looked up. The peaceful waves of the ocean seemed to have calmed them both. World peace. Huh. I guess that will be the day, then. Jiraiya laughed at that. Your father and your mother definitely wanted that world for you, kid. Minato was much like you, orphaned as a child, clan less in a status that a lot of people didn't envy when he was young and your mother had been from a clan that was wiped off from the face of the earth. Parents losing children, children losing parents, tragedies of man-made horrors destroyed the lives of everyone. Monsters are created in the name of nations and in the name of ideologies, sacrifices that amount to nothing. It's a horrible place to live. So much that we revere death in a fashion that to die for the sake of our ideals, our countries, our families, is an honor worth having. Naruto seemed nodded at that, his moment at death's door reminded him of the faces who had anguished by the thought of his death. Try as he might that he wanted to say that he fought tenaciously to the bitter end, it still ended with his loved ones mourning and feeling that loss a sense of emptiness and accumulated rage that was ready to explode in any second. You don't think it's worthwhile, Aero Senen? Naruto asked and Jiraiya shook his head. What use is a dead shinobi, Naruto? Other than to add into the memorial stone, or another body count in the list, a dead shinobi is gone, just another memory. Just another soul to be mourned over as people they left behind sink further into their sorrow. Being revered as heroes isn't worth it if the ones you love would never be able to cope with that loss. I'm sure you saw what happened to Tsunade before she became Hokage, right? Naruto did, but she got over it. But it took a long time for Tsunade to even move forward past her loss. That was how devastated she was. That's why we have to live and we have make this world at least a little more bearable for the rest. I'll consider myself a failure if I fail to leave behind a world that's a little better than when I got into it. You know, you are acting pretty cool just right now, Aero Senen. Naruto said with a smirk as Jiraiya flinched at the blonde's nickname again. I really hate that nickname of yours, brat. You really need to learn to respect your elders. Naruto eyed his sensei for a moment before replying, I'll do it if you stop using me as an inspiration for your books. Seriously, you only used my appearance and then just gave your character a different name, Tatsumaki Arashi. Really? Also, why do I have to read your damn books? Proofreading. Kid, it's part of your training in Fuenjutsu. Besides, don't you want to be associated as the model whose very definition is a harem protagonist? Naruto sighed. I don't want to be a harem protagonist, Hinata's enough for me, Aero Senen. Says the pure boy who has never had sex. Jiraiya retorted. And you do. And those visits at the brothels don't count for your conquests. Naruto's comeback merely made Jiraiya laugh even harder. Come on, kid. Don't be like that. Ever heard what my lady friends tell me about you? They say they want to swallow you whole because of how cute you are. I can't believe I'm hearing this. My own godfather is pimping me out. Why shouldn't I? Kashina wanted a son and she wanted her son to give her so many grandbabies. No, no, no. Of course, Jiraiya was kidding. If Kashina were alive and heard anything of what Jiraiya said, she would have commenced a beat down that would make the Uchiha massacre look like a mere slap on the face. But Naruto didn't need to know that. Ahoy, Jiraiya and kid. We'll be making a pit stop to one of the aisles for resupplies and cargo. Sorry about this, but your trip to Uzushiogakur will be a little delayed. The captain's first mate informed the duo as. Jiraiya nodded, so where are we docking? Yeah, it will be quick since we aren't allowed to stay long. It's a village of babes, though so you can ogle but not touch. Jiraiya was already drooling. I think it was called Natashiko village. Suddenly, all color left Jiraiya's face as he twitched. Aero Senen. Naruto asked as he looked at Jiraiya's expression as if he'd seen a ghost. Hey, first mate, can I ask for a favor and let me hide anywhere in the ship for at least the whole stay in Natashiko? A strange request, but okay. Not sure why though, you're going to totally miss out, Jiraiya-san. Trust me, I am totally fine on missing out on that. Naruto scowled. Okay, what did you do this time? 
Jiraiya was sweating bullets eyes looking shifty and nervous, I didn't do anything. But, for sanity's sake, let's just say I have commitment issues. Naruto replied with a deadpan voice, commitment issues. Really, sensei, the only commitments I ever saw in you was one with your telescope and your hobby. But you're telling me you almost bagged someone and you bailed. This coming from the guy who keeps insulting me that I'm some pure boy who needed to get laid. Jiraiya seemed insulted at that, I'll have you know that I'm a man willing to settle down too, brat. I just couldn't find the right woman and I got too involved with work to ever give her that chance. Excuses. Naruto's eyes were rolling at this, yeah, keep telling yourself that. Whatever, kid. Listen, once we dock, do not tell them that you're my apprentice, got that? Do not even mention my name. All right, if so much as a slip of the tongue happens, you're going to wish you didn't. For both of our sakes since you're a damn prude that likes to think of his chastity. I mean it this time. Jiraiya said as he sauntered back into the main bridge of the small ferry to look for hiding places and left Naruto to his own devices. Naruto didn't seem to take those words to mind though and then to pass the time, the blonde grabbed his scroll and began formulating theories for his current project. It can't be that bad, can it? A strange thing to ask, because knowing his luck, it definitely was a possibility. Konoha. Shikamaru had managed to meet up with his team for today for a little get-together. It had been a while since they caught up. What with all the hectic schedules that they all had to go through. I swear, Yakiniku Q again. Asuma Sensei, when are we going to get to another restaurant for team meetups like this? It kind of feels like this is a routine now. Asuma grinned, well, this is the perfect spot for a team. You get to eat what you make in the grill while I can smoke. Talks usually last longer over a meal like this. I don't care if we meet up here or Ichiraku, either's fine if I'm being honest. Shikamaru replied as he put a piece of sliced beef towards the grill. Asuma gave a sigh as he said, not seeing each other in a couple of weeks and you guys act like you see each other every day. Not even a, how are you guys doing? The current Team 10 had been the many that were sent on solo low tier missions as of late except for Asuma who was much more needed in the higher mission ratings while Shikamaru's missions were less frequent due to his current position as Shikaku's personal secretary. At least that's what the Junin had cynically put it. To be fair, it wasn't what I had in mind after training but we all managed to bump in on one another in such a coincidence. Shikamaru replied. Ino gave a sigh as well, I think I might need a break. It's been a while since I got to sit here and have some small talk. The lectures at the hospital, the training with Anko and the others along with Kurenai Sensei's training can really stress me out. Oh, Kurenai finally took one of you, huh? I was actually wondering myself when she was going to officially start teaching. I take Choji out to the fire temple every other day or two when I'm not busy along with Chuza. Seemed like a good fit at the time. Choji gave a nod as he was somewhat doubly hungry today, that place is a nightmare. Chiraku sensei is quite the slave driver. And the food was just. Choji sobbed a little. Their rations were only adequate for one human not an Akamichi. Chiraku often ordered him to collect water at the very base of a mountain with a time limit and he was often scolded during meditation hours for falling asleep while sitting. You sent Choji to a monk's temple, sensei. In what world gave you that idea? Shikamaru asked, incredulous that Asuma had managed to convince Choji's parents about it. Oh please, it's not that hard. I just had to explain to Chuza-san what I wanted to do with Choji to help him grow. It was easy to convince Chuza-san, Choji just didn't expect it would be that hard. When you have a sign inside in big characters that says, absolute diligence, and, perfection of discipline, I guess I should have prepared myself better. Choji said as he took another slice of perfectly cooked grilled beef from the hot charcoals. Since his time training with the monks at Fire Temple, his meal times were drastically reduced. His breakfast was not as he had desired, there were no snack times, his lunch was light and usually got from the land and donations and dinner was a simple affair of rice and fish. An Akamichi, who relied on calories for their jutsu, would not have been fit to take missions on that standards alone. That and the chores and training sessions were absolutely brutal. Like the aforementioned getting water at the base of a mountain and climbing back up to the temple, how Choji was forced to endure being hit with sticks to help him endure pain more as well as to make him channel his anger better. 
Ino and Shikamaru was noticing that Choji didn't seem like he was gaining weight as much as his father but rather, developing mass via growing muscles. At first, Asuma was worried when he saw the results, after all the Akamichi's jutsu were very specific for using their lipids as a form of extra storage for their chakra. There was a certain effect, though, Choji could still use his jutsu but to a more precise level. He could turn faster with his meatball tank technique and he could hit faster with it too. Asuma had to ask Shizun for how Choji was still able to do them and he remembered her answers as if they were a matter of fact. Well, Choji-san having managing that form without as much use of his adipose tissue is a little surprising but maybe not so. How come? Shizun hummed at this for a few seconds and replied, I'm not entirely sure how the Akamichi's ability to use their calorie techniques but as a general overall rule, muscles store a more efficient form of energy called glycogen. They don't stay in the body as much as fat in a period of time, but glycogen stays longer than glucose and muscles use glycogen more than fat themselves for movement. Since the calorie control technique requires a huge amount of calories to be used, we are talking about how much energy Choji Kun would burn per technique and not necessarily what kind of energy storage form he has to tap into and since glycogen has that efficient number down, my theory is that Choji may not hit as hard but he can certainly focus all that power in a more controllable form and may in fact increase his potency. And what an improvement it was. Choji may not have much body fat in his system due to his build turning to muscular than anything else, but he can dish hits so hard that he may not even have to expend as much energy as he needs to before. Well it's doing wonders, Choji, maybe you should keep it up. Ino said with a smile as Choji smiled at that too. Yeah, it's not like I could decline. The monks were strict, but they also teach me things. Letting me go with their daily routines and practicing. One monk decided to help me with efficiently run or stride. It certainly helped me with coming up with jutsu, that's for sure. Shikamaru raised an eyebrow at this and smiled, you got creative, Choji. Choji grinned at this, yeah, I got some jutsus that I learned just by those exercises, it made collecting water less of a hassle and it made me get a better pace to reduce my time with chores and more on training. My father even helped me with learning bojutsu. Wow. Nice to know that you could improve so much. So far on my end, my dad just began tutoring me in handling a sword myself. I think he went overboard with that and asking one of his friends to help me with that regard with all this help and sessions I've been getting as of late. Asuma rolled his eyes at this, Inoichi was definitely a father that would spoil his daughter Rotten. Ino then continued, speaking of which, I hear the Chunin exams are up again. Ino then looked at Shikamaru. And there's talk around here that you're going to be assigned as one of the organizers in Suna. Talk about big shot moves this early on in the game, Shikamaru. Or is it because a certain sister of a certain case cage asked for a request for you? Got me there. Hokage sama was all too willing with sending me there, despite of what's going on. Shikamaru said with a shrug as he then continued, it'll be conducted in a year's time anyway, so I've got plenty to think about until then. Ooh casually blowing off something important. Shikamaru. I envy you so much right now, damn it. Ino shouted as he patted Shikamaru's left shoulder as her form of congratulations. Oh please, if I could shrug off this responsibility on anyone else, I would. But my pops kept pushing me. Shikamaru said as he slumped on to his chair while Asuma grinned at this. Shikamaru. You do know the implications of this, right? other than for Tsunade showing off her shinobi as a show of force and competence. I don't think it's at all that much to think about. Asuma laughed at his student who seemed to not want to talk about what he was about to say, sure, if you don't mind to be a candidate for a political marriage with the sister of the current case cage. Or in this case, an almost willing candidate. I would rather not talk about this, Shikamaru said, trying to douse out whatever fires his teammates were about to set ablaze but to no avail. Ino just started tossing more wood on to the fire, oh, I think I've heard about this. During one of Tamari-san's visits, she mentioned how it was a pain with dealing with suitors that she didn't want. Apparently, Suna thought it would be a waste if the bloodline of the current and former case cage weren't passed down. Personally, I think it's hogwash. I mean, why stifle Tamari-san's career this early on? She's definitely a kunoichi worth her salt if she can stand with the best of them. You sure about that, Shikamaru? From our impressions, she's certainly not your type. Choji probed his friend with this. Choji knew Shikamaru inside and out. 
Shikamaru palmed his face at this. Why is everybody talking about this as if it's a done deal? And why do I have to be the one to be considered a candidate in marrying that scary woman? Why the hell not, Shikamaru? You're practically being entered into royalty. Answered Ino. She did not understand Shikamaru's take in all this. It's like a reverse of a prince pulling out a fair maiden from hardship. That and Shikamaru wouldn't have to work as much as he wanted. Look, I don't think I can think of marriage at this point in time, especially on a political move that can shake our foundations with Tamari on that. But you're not averse to it, right? Ino pointed out. A beat. Choji and Asuma were staring at each other for a few seconds and then turned their attention to Shikamaru. Shikamaru never thought that he would be cornered like that. Hokage Tower. Tsunade was shaking in her desk as soon as Jiraiya had sent her his progress report on Naruto's well-being as well as the suspicious activities happening in Suchi no Kuni and Aim. Tsunade. We've got big trouble. One of my contacts has reported of a strange behavioral pattern shown by Onoki after his disappearance almost a week ago. One of his accountant friends is reporting of a large sum of money currently being funneled to an undisclosed place in Lightning Country too. Whatever it is, Onoki is pushing his luck against A. I fear for the worst, but I have my agents working in overtime to look into this. Also, there's something you should know about Naruto. It concerns him and his abduction just a little over a year ago. The results of the infusion of Hashirama's cells didn't give him the Mokudan, it awakened something else, or rather, someone else within him. The person is calling himself as Otsutsuki Asura, I have no idea how, but Naruto mentioned that his current existence is tied to his previous incarnation as Senju Hashirama. Or so Asura mentions, I have no basis if I should believe this or not, but the behavioral changes that Naruto displays and the strange shift of his chakra to so much young energy is something to behold. Birds and mammals flock to him, plants grow and flowers bloom in his proximity whenever this chakra is active. He says he can't do Mokudan, he lacks the requirements for it. But the presence of that yang chakra of his, it's unbelievable. Attached to this scroll are three sealing arrays, one is a detailed message from one of my spies in Iowa, the second contains a list of those who know what Naruto is carrying and the third is information on an outpost associated with Orochimaru just in rice country. We will be going off the grid after one month. The only method you will be reaching us will be by messenger toad that I will be sending every two weeks through a shortcut in Konoha that I've established in Myobokuzen. Once you've extracted the two messages, burn this scroll down. Leave no trace of it. Jiraiya. Tsunade looked at Shikaku and said, tell cryptologist responsible for decoding this message to keep quiet. This is an S-rank secret the likes of which that even we keep from our most important personnel. This secret isn't getting out. Ever. Call Inoichi and Ibiki. This is a serious matter. The only one who we must divulge this info to is Team 7's current commander, Hitaki Kakashi. Tsunade then used a simple fire jutsu and burned the scroll as she looked at the two messages of Jiraiya's latest reports. Onoki, what exactly are you up to? Pardon my questioning. God I'm Sama, but I have to ask what are your thoughts on this moving forward? Shikaku asked and Tsunade nodded. We prepare for the worst. Shikaku nodded. When the Hokage told him to prepare, a new strategy must be set in place. Tsunade was preparing for a war on multiple fronts. Grass country. It was time to investigate the cave. The two grass ninja had split up. One of them was going to accompany Team 7 while the other remained as outside watch and to prevent any curious wanderer into the cave. At the first few minutes that they entered, Sasuke was cautiously looking around with his Sharingan. His guard has not let up since last night. In order to somewhat placate his fears, Sasuke suggested a formation where Sakura would be the center, Sai at the rear, Sasuke who would take point with the grass ninja and behind Sakura was Kakashi. Two hours since their entrance, Sasuke still looked like he's on edge still. Every step he took felt like something was watching him. On the walls, on the floor and on the roof of the cave. He was careful with every step he took. Every action he made he took with great caution. Something in this place was just too creepy for him and he might end up something that he would dread. When they finally made it to what Sasuke could tell was at the very end of this cave that was deceptively large for a giant stone outgrowth, he looked around at the spacious area and saw two simple plain stones placed like grave markings with no name on it. Further out, he saw something that he never thought he would see. 
There out into the large enclosure was a large eerie stone statue in a lotus position its hands held in shackles with palms raised upwards and fingers as if in a posture of begging. Its face was wide open and its eyes were shielded as if it was bowing. What on earth is that? The grass ninja shouted. Oh no, we have intruders. That voice snapped Sasuke out of his thoughts as he quickly drew two shuriken and let it fly to the direction of the voice he heard. The sound of shuriken hitting stone was all they could hear as Sasuke gripped his sword strapped at his back. Sai seeing this posture mimicked Sasuke as well and grabbed a small scroll in his pocket. He had prepared himself earlier just for something like this and drew twenty mice with his ink. Ninpo. Choju Giga, super beast imitating drawing, he muttered and twenty hand-drawn mice came to life from his scroll, scurrying on the floor and going in every which way. Kakashi had two kanai drawn just in case as Sakura had drawn both her swords from her back. I can't let you guys go if you have seen this statue. Toby will have my head. Then, from the ground, a man wearing a simple black cloak began rising up, wearing a white spiral mask on his face. And just like that Sasuke drew his sword, who are you? Guru Guru. The man jovially replied and soon, the earth rumbled underneath them. A massive wooden statue then erupted from the earth below as Team 7 and the grass ninja all jumped back as the wooden statue began to take shape of a large oni, with a serpentine dragon wrapping itself around the torso with its head craning by the ona's right shoulder. Impossible. Mokuden. Wood release, Kakashi exclaimed. This was impossible. This was a jutsu that only Senju Hashirama can do. Sasuke looked up, cold sweat escaping him. He could feel his heartbeat rising faster and faster. This was the power of the first Hokage. This was ridiculous. We need to get out of here, now. Kakashi commanded to his team as the giant Oni statue began stomping its way to the shinobi team. Sakura looked at Sasuke who was still staring at the behemoth statue as Sai began unraveling another scroll. Just then, from the ground, at least 100 white humanoids began rising up. All looking exactly the same, with their creepy soulless and dead eyes. The creatures all looked at them and said, those who are not allowed to see the ghetto Mazo, must never escape. Sasuke was quick to snap out of his thoughts and immediately swung Murakumo to one of the white creatures who got close bisecting it clean. Sasuke then performed a jump just as his legs were about to be swept and spun in midair performing a roundhouse kick to his attacker to the face then landing on the floor as he managed to cut down another one of these white creatures. Sasuke then planted his sword on the ground and began performing a set of hand seals as one of the wooden giant's fingers were aimed on him. Kaden. Goryuka no Jutsu, Fire Release, Great Dragon Flame Technique. Three large fireballs shaped like dragon heads appeared from Sasuke's mouth as he breathed them out and sent them upwards towards the giant wooden statue who fired a wooden stake at him. The flames and wooden beam collided and burned the stake to a crisp. Guru Guru noted that the flames were hot enough to burn of such a thick wooden pole and the flames scattered upon reaching its hand, blocking Guru Guru's vision of Sasuke. As soon as the flames created enough of a distraction Sasuke had cut his thumb with his blade and performed the next set of seals. Kuchio's no jutsu. At the same time, Sakura was cutting down her assailants left and right. One who had reached for her suddenly found himself in a joint lock with Sakura's arm and was immediately stabbed through the chest with her sword. In quick succession, Sakura pulled out one of her swords from her victim's chest and proceeded to trip the man before tossing him to another creature and then quickly cutting down her opponent in quick slashes of five in a mere two seconds. When she heard of Sasuke perform his fire release techniques, Sakura was quick to take to jump and slam her right hand on the ground, Aokasho, cherry blossom impact. Boom. The ground beneath her shattered and caved as several of the white creatures lost their balance or was sent away due to the shockwave of Sakura's attack. She then found her opportunity and rushed to one of the legs of the wooden giant just as Sasuke performed another set of hand seals. Sakura began cutting down her foes to her front as she bulldozed her way to the wooden giant's right foot proceeded to sheath her blades and leapt forward, she cocked her left fist back, gathering as much chakra as she could through her hand and unleashed it in a matter of milliseconds as she made contact with the wooden leg. Mankai. Aokasho, full bloom. Cherry blossom impact. Boom. A thundering noise escaped and echoed throughout the entire cave. The effect was instantaneous. In a matter of one second, Sakura had destroyed the footing of Wooden Giant as she skidded to the other side, she looked at her handiwork as it began to lose balance and fell down. 
A cry of a bird soon brought her out of her stupor as a hand grabbed her from above and saw Sasuke was riding a hawk summon to get out. Kakashi, who was doing his best to stay alive by cutting through multiple creatures at once, saw himself standing incredulous as Sasuke and Sakura managed to take down the giant wooden statue. No, something was not right. That statue did not have what the legends say about Senju Hashirama's technique. It was not quick enough, not powerful enough and not sturdy enough to fight off a tailed beast. He remembered the texts of a lot of historians both in and out of fire country pertaining to the Mokujin no Jutsu, wooden human technique, as comparable to a tailed beast. Kakashi ducked, his Sharingan spinning wildly as he evaded another strike coming from these seemingly unintelligent creatures. Kakashi then drove a lightning-enhanced kanai through its chest and spun around to leave the lifeless fool falling on the ground. Another set of hand seals blurred from his hands and shouted. Doden. Ritsudo Tensho, Earth Release. Tearing Earth Turning Palm. Kakashi then slammed both his palms on the ground and turned outwards the earth rumbled beneath his feet as it rose up and tore to multiple pieces as the creatures lost their footing. Kakashi jumped, catching Sasuke's arm as he did so while the Uchiha pulled him up. Take us out, now. Kakashi commanded sternly, that Mokujin no Jutsu may be incomplete but that didn't mean it wasn't dangerous enough. Where's Sai? Kakashi asked and just on cue, the pale-faced boy was there, also riding a gigantic bird, only this time, it was made of ink. Behind Sai was the grass nin, too spooked out after what just happened. Just as they were flying, a shrill cry was heard from where they left. Kakashi looked back and his Sharingan immediately recognized a wooden dragon about to head their way. Don't stop for that exit, Sasuke, Sakura, back me up. We're not through just yet. Gathering chakra within his Sharingan, Kakashi closed both his eyes and focused on his Sharingan. As soon as he said those words, a wooden dragon had been made visible towards them. It was faster than anyone had ever expected, it slithered its way towards them and roared but Kakashi was prepared. Kakashi opened his Sharingan, and the three Tomo spinning around the red irises soon morphed into wing blades as it spun. The Mangeku Sharingan came to life. Kamui, supreme authority of the gods. A black orb of nothingness appeared, sucking up all of space around it as the wooden dragon suddenly crashed into its sphere as it was immediately swallowed up. It was only for a five seconds but the whole wooden dragon was swallowed up into the black void before it dispersed as they all managed to see the exit. Kakashi panted as he collapsed on top of the hawk, Sakura supporting her as their leader said, we need to evacuate that village. As soon as they reached for the exit, the one grass ninja guarding the entrance was surprised when Sai's ink bird grabbed the man by the shoulders and headed skyward towards the top of the plateau. The mission was a failure. Sasuke looked back, the image of the giants he had seen today lingered in his mind. One that of intense power, the other of a monstrous statue that seemed to slowly creep in his mind. What was the ghetto Mazo? He did not notice it at first, but his eyes had spontaneously converted to the Mangekio Sharingan. Konoha. One week had passed since Tsunade received Jiraiya's letter. Three fronts, Tsunade was fighting this cold war on three separate fronts. The first with Orochimaru, the snake user was still running wild out there committing acts of inhumanity with his research. The man had promised destruction on Konoha's walls. And Orochimaru was obsessed with it. The second front was with Akatsuki, the mysterious organization who were after Naruto, for what purpose, she didn't know but a loss of a tailed beast is a major blow to any village and to lose them means the wolves could show up anytime like. The third front that has Tsunade concerned, Onoki the old fogey, was beginning to commit random acts of aggression in a subtler way. Correspondence with Jiraiya has informed Konoha's intelligence branch that Onoki is funneling money towards Lightning Country and having rogue ninjas harass small villages and towns in A's territory, for what purpose was Onoki doing this she didn't know, but it seems a communication channel has opened up between Aim and Suchi no Kuni. An alliance was forming perhaps. It was all conjecture, there was no proof of Onoki being directly linked to these small skirmishes. They still had no reports of the auditing that was done for this to happen. If only they had that, it would be easy to understand how much aggression Onoki was pressing against A. Tsunade didn't want to think of such possibility. The rest of the superpowers should stand their grounds and de-escalate this tension against Lightning Country. But she had to bide her time a little, until a breakthrough happens, she would be bracing on her seat. All she could do now, 
was to minimize all the dangers that their country is facing today. It was why she was standing before Asuma and Guy who were with Team 10 as Tsunade cleared her throat and spoke, we've found an outpost that we suspect belongs to Orochimaru. I want your team to go there and find any information you can about Orochimaru's possible location. The more we can pin down his bases, the less he can move freely. Mission details will be given to you with this scroll. An Anbu team will be with you at the border as they are currently on reconnaissance duty. Orochimaru has recently left this base, so there's no need to worry of him coming back there. The bastard doesn't stay too long in one place. Once you find your objectives, destroy the base. It was time to push things forward. Chapter 25. Inheritors Part 2. One week had passed since Shino had met Fu. In that one week, he saw Fu every three days and the strange girl seemed to have gravitated towards him whenever they were at the official border crossing. Due to Takigaku's secrecy, many of its economic policies revolved around exchanges in their border and since then, the frequency of her visits became a regular thing. Many of Shino's peers seemed to grin at this and teased their junior about this occurrence for no less than five minutes as Shino replied in a matter-of-fact tone without ever stuttering or even bashful of his intentions with the girl. Man, you're hard to play mind games with, you know that, Kohai. One of the Chunin commented and Shino shrugged at this. Perhaps my way of speaking tends to make jokes on my expense fall flat. There you go again, always so formal and droll. I don't understand why a cute girl like Fu San seemed way too okay hanging out with you. The Chunin further commented. Shino raised an eyebrow at this and the senior Chunin grinned. Wondering about that, no worries, Kohai, we don't have a diagram on how to understand the fairer sex and they don't understand how we think too. We don't exactly have blueprints in that shit. Best we could do is go with the flow. Shino nodded at this, I understand. But your implication of romantic undertones with her seem quite inappropriate for what Fu San thinks of me. You sure about that? His senior grinned again as he patted his junior at the shoulder. I'm positive. The Chunin shrugged at this, if you really think that way, then let me give you some advice. Time spent together is time meant for meaningful bonds. In our line of work, every connection we share is important. We don't exactly have the best record of longevity for our careers. It's not wasteful as others might think. After all, our finite lives are meant to be lived, you know. Maybe you don't feel that way, but why spend time pondering when you can just throw caution to the wind? Well, that's for less serious stuff, anyway, Kohai. I'm sure you understand though, right? Shino gave a nod as a reply. Shino. The conversation of the two Konoha shinobi was cut short when Fu had arrived and was waving at him to get his attention. Don't look now, but your girlfriend is at your six. I'll be talking with one of the merchants, make sure you get yours, all right. Shino raised another eyebrow as his senior gave him a wink and a devilish smile as he slipped away from the Abarame to give the boy some alone time. Was the man implying something? Shino didn't seem to understand that. Mo, don't just stand there. Shino, wave back. Fu said with a pout. Shino adjusted his glasses and discarded whatever his senior had implied. Shino merely gave a small wave as Fu grinned and rushed over to him. So get this. Fu began as Shino listened intently. Fu was a flighty person. No pun intended, Shino had known for the time she had interacted with him. She was chatterbox full of stories that she found interesting and was as lively as one of his friends. Her boundless enthusiasm didn't seem forced, it seemed genuine for her. Her spirit certainly seemed to liven up everywhere she went. And for her to focus on him felt nice. A genuine appreciation for his presence felt honestly good for himself. Many of his friends back at home criticized him for his seemingly lack of presence whenever they gathered but it was all in good nature, but sometimes he couldn't help but feel that a wall was built in between him and his friends. Although Shino certainly wanted to have better interactions with his companions back home, his aloof nature sometimes deterred many of his peers. Kiba had tried to encourage him to be more social, but Kiba's idea of social interaction and his idea of connecting were completely different. As Fu continued on, Shino had noticed many of her stories did not involve a whole lot of people, but rather places she saw and the animals she discovered outside her home. It was expected for Fu to keep silent on anything about her village, but to not even talk about the people around her daily. Wordlessly, Shino slowly came to a conclusion that he would rather not think about. Is she like Naruto? A Jinchuriki? 
Perhaps it is why she's being targeted by Akatsuki. All at once, Shino felt like he had to be on alert at all times when talking with Fu. Akatsuki was a dangerous group. It provoked a red alert status within his village, managed to slip by inside and almost captured Naruto for their mysterious goals. From what he could gather, Fu seemed aware of Akatsuki. That interaction with Shibuki, who he had realized to be the current leader of Taki, seemed to confirm his suspicions on the matter. If so, what was Fu doing outside the safety of her village? Should she not be inside the village, safe and away from the hands of such a dangerous group? Away from the two ninja, a Taki nin had been observing their interaction, the man remained in a frown as one of the shinobi in their group mentioned, Fu San seems livelier than usual, doesn't she? The senior of the group had nodded. Back at home, Fu was an anxious and sullen girl. She didn't even interact much with her age group seeing as they were afraid of her. Shibuki-sama was right. Inside the village, she is a jinchuriki, a vessel in charge of the nanabi. But here, in this border, she's not but a little girl, hungry for friends. Ever since the sealing ritual on her, people had avoided her like the plague. The previous leader had designated her as Taki's secret weapon aside from the hero water. It had put her on a status as a weapon too dangerous for anyone to use. Many of the elders saw her as a tool and unfeelingly told their children to avoid interacting with her as her ward can snap in a moment's notice. In their fear, people had avoided her like a plague. I do not appreciate this kind of sentimentality concerning the vessel. She is an asset to our forces. Treating her as something else is a negligent action especially with what she will have to deal with. One of the shinobi said, shaking his head in disdain of having the vessel interact with another human, a shinobi from foreign lands no less. The eldest of the group scowled at that, that may be true. But I have a daughter in the same age as her. If my daughter was the one who has to deal with that isolation, then I don't know what I would do if you said those words in front of me. The other scowled back, happiness is a luxury in our work. Sentiments like that will kill us. This is ridiculous, Shibuki Dono needs to understand that we can't give her preferential treatment like this, we cannot afford it. Akatsuki is not a group one wishes to trifle with. Blasted, inconsiderate fool. They all knew that, but a moment of humanity was what Fu needed, not the everyday life of being labeled as a last resort of total destruction. Her fate was sealed the moment they sealed the nanabi inside her. She was meant to live a cold and uncaring life, away from the eyes of the people and treated coldly by others until she died with no one else but her on her deathbed. The elder clicked his tongue at this. An hour. He was going to give Fu an hour to talk to her friend like this before they had back to Taki. Shino meanwhile, continued to listen to Fu who continued to speak away in her own pace. Fu. Fu immediately stopped when Shino had called her name, yes, Shino. She looked eager about what he had to say, do you not have any friends at your home? Fu paused for a moment and Shino caught wind of her surprised expression before she grinned, of course, I have friends, Shino. I have Shibuki-sama and, and. Shino looked at her as she struggled to come up with names of friends she usually associated with. Shino then sat down and gestured for Fu to sit beside him, patiently waiting for Fu to speak. A minute later, Fu was a bit sullen as Shino then spoke. The fact that you struggle to come up with a name other than Shibuki-sama is telling. Fu, for the first time since she arrived, was silent upon hearing Shino's words. She felt like running away after Shino had caught her lying again. But Shino didn't seem to mind her with that lie. He even told her to sit beside him. She looked down and grabbed her legs as she leaned down and buried her face to her knees. I noticed that your stories always seem to revolve around places and animals you see outside but you never mention people inside your village. You never tell anything about having fun with others. I can tell. So don't come up with any more lies when speaking to me, I can understand what it's like to be in your position. But I have a friend who struggled with the same thing. Shino spoke, as nice as he could. Even if his words were soft-spoken and still somewhat abrasive. Fu San, tell me, why do you need to tell me a white lie? Why the need to lie? There was a quiet pause for a moment as Fu spoke, because you might think I'm weird. Shino raised an eyebrow at this, Fu was already weird. But it didn't mean that her weirdness was off-putting. Shino understood social cues, better than what Kiba would give him credit for. Shino knew that Fu's current predicament was more to blame than her personality. I would need to be straight to you, 
Pu San, from a normal person's standpoint, you are already a weird person. But that weirdness does not warrant isolation. Also, friends do not judge others for their eccentricities. Rather, they accept each other. No matter how many quirks one has. Fu seemed to smile a little from that. But can you say that if you knew the truth? Shino wordlessly looked at Fu whose face was still hidden by her legs. I have my suspicions, but I will keep silent about it, until Fu San is ready to talk. Fu, we're heading back. Fu stood up wordlessly on her own as she looked down, Shino noted her look of sadness and disappointment for a second as it was replaced with a smile that Shino had come to appreciate as something else. For a moment, Shino saw a 12-year-old blonde-haired boy who gave a wide face splitting grin before Fu came running back to her group. See you, Shino. Fu San. Shino could not finish his sentence. Fu was gone in a matter of seconds. Konoha. After a grueling week of a failed mission, Sakura, Sasuke, Kakashi and Sai finally arrived at Konoha. Kakashi had to recuperate upon using the Mangekio Sharingan. The two grass ninja with them had notified their village of an evacuation order of a nearby village and they had to help. Immediately, the town was forced to give up their land and their livelihood to live far away from the site of Canopy Bridge as possible. It was in their stay to recuperate that Sasuke started having nightmares. That statue that he saw had left a mark in his mind. Sakura had grown worried, seeing Sasuke waking up in a cold sweat night after night was like seeing a child having another traumatic experience for the first time. It did not leave Sasuke in a blubbering mess, seeing as Sakura was there to help him get his sleep. His mental health did not need to suffer any longer. The aftermath of the mission severely bogged down their return home. And once they were home, Kakashi had graced them with an immediate dismissal. Sasuke was about to ask about their teacher's access to the Sharingan's evolved state but that would be put in the back burner for now. By the time Sai had wordlessly left the group, Sasuke finally spoke. Sakura. Sasuke was the first to say before Sakura was out of earshot. Sakura stopped her tread on the way home and looked back at her teammate who was looking to his right with a faraway look on his face. I need your help. Sasuke continued. Sakura's eyes widened at Sasuke's words. It was the first time the Uchiha had outright asked for anyone's help out of his lips. Internally, Sakura wanted to swoon but she knew that it wouldn't help her case now. Especially not when Sasuke was asking for her help. What is it, Sasuke-kun? Is this about those nightmares? Sasuke nodded as he recalled his dreams in vivid detail. He did not want to wake up to an empty house whose silence may not help his sanity. Sakura frowned at this, how can I help? Sasuke thought about his decision to ask help from her, he desperately wanted help for now, but his idea was somewhat inappropriate and it may give Sakura the wrong idea. Nevertheless, he was getting desperate. The nightmares were haunting and it was pushing his fears back into the fold. Sakura had been helping him throughout the nights as they headed home. And with no one else to turn to, Sasuke opted for Sakura's help. Just stay with me for a while. I'll have a room prepared at my house. If you want to. I'll even ask permission from your parents. I, I need this. Sasuke-kun. Sakura wanted to think that this was her chance, her opportunity to win Sasuke over to her. But the look on Sasuke's face told her that it wasn't what he needed right now. All right, it might be a little awkward with my parents, but I'll do what I can to help you. Sasuke nodded at this, thanks. Now came the question of how she was going to convince her parents to let her stay at a boy's house. Alone. That was going to be extremely awkward. A few hours later, a lengthy discussion, embarrassment and threats coming from Sakura's father, the girl in question had some of her things in her bags as Sasuke helped her carry her luggage back to the Uchiha clan compound. Haruno Mebuki, Sakura's mother watched her daughter who was looking serious discussing things with her teammate, a sullen and quiet boy that they knew to be Uchiha Sasuke, the last of Konoha's prestigious Uchiha clan. She had heard much about the boy's temperament and his prodigal ability only 14 and already reaching to the height of Anbu status. The boy certainly had the drive and that drive certainly helped her daughter to blossom into the kunoichi she is today. Their other teammate also had been making waves earlier and being apprenticed by one of the Sanin seemed like a pedigree many parents would kill for. 14 and already moving out of her parents. This is unthinkable. Why did we let her anyway? Her thoughts were interrupted by an irate Kazashi her husband who was looking at the young pair while grinding his teeth. 
He had subtly led his threat across the Uchiha a little earlier and the young man seemed to have just agreed to his threats, seeming like he just wanted to get over this conversation and run away. Because her teammate asked for her help, did he not? Mebuki answered while Kazashi began grinding his teeth in rage. But going to his house unaccompanied with no adult supervision. That's like when some boy asks her. Hey, my parents are gone, want to go hang out in my place and chill. Kazashi even went so far as mimicking his voice to that of a baritone and tried so hard to make it sound sexy. The man then continued with bloodshot eyes. I don't care if he's the last Uchiha but if he so much as touches a hair on her head, Konoha will be existing without his clan in the foreseeable future. Kazashi then pointed to Sasuke as the two were walking away, you hear that you damn punk. No touching my daughter, ever. She only does so when my bones are turned to ash. You hear me. Sakura was blushing up a storm when Kazashi shouted those threats as Mebuki had mysteriously obtained a frying pan out of nowhere and smacked the ever-living daylights out of her husband. You're embarrassing your daughter. Get inside the house. I swear every single time a boy manages to look at your daughter you scare them all to death. For the love of your crying now. Sakura was ducking her head out of pure shame as she and Sasuke made their way to the Uchiha compound. You have good parents. Sasuke commented as Sakura looked at him in wonder. Sasuke then recalled his own parents, wishing still they were alive and well. Sakura then seemed to recall the outburst Sasuke had when they first teamed up and when Sakura was talking about Naruto's lack of parenting. Sakura flinched a little, recalling that moment when she said how lucky Naruto was without his parents. Yet in the perspective of her teammates, they found Sakura to have the best childhood out of the three of them. I remember the time when we first assembled as a team. I remember telling you how lucky Naruto was having without parents. I remember that time when you got angry. I was insensitive to that perspective between you two. Sakura mentioned and looked down, but not out of embarrassment this time, but a kind of shame filled with remorse. She then continued, I understand now what you meant, Sasuke-kun. I understand now why you got so angry. I'm sorry. No one deserves a life like that. Where you don't have the love and support of your parents, going home alone, no one to greet you, in an empty house where no one welcomes you back. That's, that's so sad. Sasuke remained silent for a second as he looked up, the image of his destroyed family appeared in his mind. More than anything else, my family may not have been perfect, I struggled to come out of my brother's shadow, I wanted my father's approval and only had my mother who I used to ignore her lessons because I idolized my brother. Beyond that, even when we were not in better terms compared to others, Sasuke then finally said his words, I love them. There isn't a day that I get back to the graves of my clansmen, but especially my parents, there isn't a day that I don't mourn for them. Every single day is a reminder of how much I lost. How much I took my mother's love for granted, how I wanted nothing more than to bring that back. He recalled himself going every morning as a boy crying on his parents' graves and going to school feeling devoid of any emotion that he felt. Every day was like walking past a burned down building. Every day he could recall Itachi cutting down his parents. But I know I can't bring them back, killing my brother won't bring back my parents. Kakashi said as much, but I, Sasuke wanted to say it, Kakashi had taught him to focus and channel his anger to a single point. To a point where his obsession didn't cloud his judgment, a single-minded focus that would be as sharp as a spear. Kakashi had drilled in his head the needed focus to achieve that and it certainly helped with his Anbu training. I get it. You want some form of closure. You want to bring Itachi's actions to justice. I understand, Sasuke-kun. Sakura then continued, your single-minded focus is to be admired, I can't help but feel a little amazed of how much you intend to carry out what you want to do. It's like having a driven purpose for that one thing. Her smile disappeared as she continued, that said though, the way that got you here is something I don't wish on anyone. Sasuke nodded at this, I know. I wish it didn't have to be this way, but what happened can't be changed. Not anymore. Kakashi understood why I have to kill Itachi. It took Naruto almost dying on us to understand that we can't cling to our past so religiously or be dragged down to a level that my brother would want me at. Sasuke spat on those words at the end. No matter how hard he tried, Itachi's actions were unforgivable to him. When they had finally arrived at his home, Sakura had noticed since she came here, that this part of the village always seemed empty. She looked back at Sasuke who was already inside. 
A thought crossed her mind for a moment. Every single day for a better part of this decade, Sasuke-kun came back here in this desolate part of the village with no one to greet him, no one to say hello. Even Naruto didn't go here. He never stated why. Maybe he just wanted to give Sasuke-kun some peace and quiet, or he didn't know how he could approach Sasuke-kun here in this empty compound. Nothing is here, only houses with no people inside, only a reminder of what he had to go through. And now, Sakura finally understood Sasuke's sad and lonely existence in a sea of sorrow. He needs help, just as much as anyone else. Eastern Sea, Natashiko Harbor. Naruto sat on the deck as cargo was being placed inside the ship. To the naked eye, Naruto looked like he was simply meditating and relaxing on his own but to those who understood, Naruto was practicing his ability to sit still and remain motionless despite the surging waves of the sea rocking their ship. A simple docking and replenishing supplies had turned into a setback when a storm warning came and the crew was forced to remain docked on this village. He had no idea just how long they were going to be stuck here but as the days grow in number so does the possibility of his sensei getting discovered and be caught in whatever problems he had set for himself and possibly dragging him along with that. Whatever it is, Naruto wasn't willing to find out. He had to focus on getting stronger and stopping Akatsuki, that was his number one priority anything else would be a hindrance at this point. My, my, you don't seem to enjoy the view that you're getting near this village. A female voice commented to Naruto's form who was diligently remaining unmoving from his spot. Naruto, who had his eye closed, merely replied without turning to the voice, sorry about that, I'm just training to stand still. My sensei told me this is an important part to what I'm about to learn. A shame. With your face and your chakra, you would be an asset for our village. Naruto had to apologize again, sorry, my loyalties lie with my village. I can't just go and swear allegiance to another village like that. Though, I guess I should thank you for the compliment. He didn't know how to respond when someone complimented on his looks. And such moral standing. I would dare say you are quite the catch. Naruto had to stop his training at that moment, he had already failed when he first spoke, but it was rude to ignore someone when they spoke first. He opened his eyes and turned to the girl who was speaking to him and found her to be one of the most beautiful women he had ever met. Long flowing black hair framing her head, heart-shaped face and gorgeous emerald green eyes, striking her gentle features and luscious lips. Her attire consisted of a furacid, a garment usually worn on special occasions back in Konoha, patterned with flowers Naruto couldn't recognize in colors of white and blue. Her obi tied to her back colored in pink and socks covered by her geta slippers, she looked like what he would describe as a cultured and high-status girl, much like how Hanada is. I honestly don't know what to say to that. Naruto replied with a nervous chuckle as he stood up and gestured for a handshake. I'm Uzumaki Naruto, I'm here because my master and I are on a trip to Uzushiogakur. Or what's left it, anyway. He said with a grin. Kasumi looked intrigued at this, her mother had told her of an extinct clan that were near their waters, they were said to be as powerful as many of the ancient clans that were on the mainland. Uzumaki. Oh, so you're an Uzumaki. I could not tell because of your hair. One of their distinct features has to be the red hair. I'm Shizuka, by the way, student to the former leader of my village. Naruto had to wonder why he gets to meet people in practically royalty so casually in his life. I see. So what are you doing here, Shizuka? I doubt that a student of a village leader would be asked to do menial labor such as watching cargo in and out of this ship. Naruto asked and the girl daintily put her covered hands over her lips and let out a small laugh. Oh. That is precisely why I'm here. I have the duty to watch over when men do trade in our gates. As much as men try to ogle at us, we try to gauge the men who are in our presence to see if they are good husband material. Shizuka then brought the hand that covered her lips to her left cheek and looked as if she was worrying. You see, in our village, we are mostly women. Our fathers are determined when a kunoichi from our village challenges their prospects and when we are defeated, we seduce the men and pull them into our village to become our husbands. It has been that way for most of our lives. Naruto began sweating bullets. If that was the case, then. So you gauge them by their strength and then drag them back here for marriage. I can't say that I find that a bit strange, to be honest. I mean no disrespect, though. Naruto was careful not to thread into waters he didn't want to step on. Besides, what would Hinata's reaction be if he was suddenly challenged by this attractive girl? Yes, 
For the rest of the world, our traditions are strange, but for some of us, Shizuka's face slightly reddened at the thought of a strong man who would sweep her of her feet. The thought of a strong and powerful man dominating me and beating me in combat as a sign of good upbringing is such a romantic gesture. Well, shit, he walked right into that one. You got easily played, brat. Nobody asked you, Kurama. Oh okay. Though I don't get why you would take your time to talking to a no-name shinobi like me aside from my surname. Most of the Uzumaki's jutsu had been forgotten since they were destroyed by the invasion. Naruto was pushing thoughts of a challenge away from himself as soon as he could. He didn't want to mess with fate and be fate's bitch if he could help it. I know, a shame it happened. But a shinobi of your caliber, young as you may be, deserved that chance as well. Shit, 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 shit. Jiraiya's voice entered his head, what's the matter, you pussy? Don't want to have a harem. Naruto inwardly cursed his sensei's tendencies and wished he could have a different form of help somehow. Oh, don't worry, even if you were eligible for that challenge, I still have a two years left before I can issue that to you, Naruto-san. A chill just went up his spine. So you're here after all, Jiraiya-sama. Well, crap. Jiraiya shrieked and ran out of the cargo bay as he went for the deck at front. The old man then stopped before Naruto as he then instructed the blonde, we need to go, now. Oh no, you're not getting away that easily. A massive slab of stone erupted from the seas as Jiraiya was startled long enough for a female figure to jump on the top of said stone and look down on the three. Jiraiya-sama, it is time to pay the debt that you owe. Oh come on, it's been years. Jiraiya bargained hoping that whatever it is he promised years ago would not come out of this woman's mouth. Truly, and you have promised your student will be challenged by our leader's student should you not meet any more. Seeing as you are here, that means that boy is your pupil, yes. Jiraiya slowly turned his head to his latest pupil and the boy was shaking in fury and contained rage that he could able to contain, Aero Senen. Oh my, so you are the student of my master's first love. This changes things then. Shizuka said this as she closed her umbrella and pointed it at Naruto. She smiled good-naturedly as she pointed her umbrella. I challenge you to a duel. Naruto looked at his soon-to-be-dead teacher and began shaking the man by the collar, you massive idiot. Look what your stupid promises got me into. Do you have any idea what kind of pain in this ass you just threw at me? How am I going to explain this to B.A.A. Chan? Better yet, how are you going to tell this to her? Jiraiya answered with a stone face as if it was the easiest answer in the world, it's all right if we don't tell her. And Hinata-chan, what about her? Naruto asked testily and Jiraiya answered by throwing him under the biju. That's for you to handle, kid. I'm not related to her by any way. Excuse me. The duo turned to the girl wearing a kimono and said, I believe that I and Naruto-sama are about to have a duel. Duels off if I suddenly end up getting hitched. I didn't come to this training just to score. Naruto vehemently, and forcefully rejected that offer. Hanada-chan was the only one for him. Nope. No deals. Tradition states that if I were denied this duel, then your life must be forfeit or I must commit seppuku after killing you, Naruto-sama. If you don't accept my duel, I may have to kill you before taking my own life. She said that with a smile and Naruto shivered at the though. A girl like her threatening him with murder-suicide sent chills down his spine and not in a good way. Just accept the duel, kid. If you win, you get a wife, if you lose you can escape that fate. Jiraiya was in by no means telling him of a cop-out. Just to be clear, if you threw the match for me, I'd consider that a disgrace and have to commit ritual suicide too. Naruto glared at Jiraiya, it was basically win and get married or die. I am so telling this to granny when I get the chance. This is your fault. Ah, I actually thought it wasn't going to happen and as long as I don't get caught, it was fine. Jiraiya said this as if that it was his best idea ever at the time. Too bad he hadn't thought of a plan if ever it did happen. Like right now. Naruto gave a sigh and then turned to Shizuka and said, fine, fine, I'm doing this stupid duel. But I'm not, by any means, marrying anyone. Pussy, Jiraiya muttered and Naruto had a tick mark at this, I don't want to hear that from someone who turned down the chance to come and get some. Now that was a low blow for Jiraiya. Deciding to stop this conflict, Jiraiya just turned to the bridge and asked them to stay for at least an hour more after the cargo was done hauling. Rice country, 
outside of Orochimaru's base. Shikamaru and his team were currently running inside Orochimaru's base, scouring the place for any signs that could help them in this campaign. It had been a week since they received their mission three days of travel and then another two days of surveillance before they finally raided the base. Guy had been sent as additional firepower for this team and was all too happy to get into the action of hopefully putting a dent on one of Konoha's greatest enemies. When the raid had commenced, Shikamaru and the team had noted that they had met little resistance when invading. The Anbu team had managed to intercept first and had taken the bulk of the defenses that the base had to offer. The report mentioned that the base was well guarded enough that any form of infiltration was too risky and that a raid of the base was better warranted but what he didn't expect was how flimsy the periphery of the base's defenses were actually. He had a bad feeling about this, Shikamaru devised a backup plan if ever guerrilla tactics were into play. The Anbu would perform a sweep and with their training, they were sure to take down any stragglers inside and they had been effective in doing so. However, no matter how elite were these shadows of the Hokage, they had been disrupted and forced to split off when they encountered a problem that Shikamaru was afraid of. Cursed seal wielders loyal to Orochimaru's cause. Being one of the people that had experience in fighting these monstrosities, Shikamaru had an idea just how ferocious these people were. His first encounter was enough to leave an impression that any normal means of taking down their enemies were out of the question. Aim to kill and never let them have a chance to enter the second stage. He advised his team when he talked about their potential encounters. What he never realized was how Orochimaru had managed to increase the scale of his little monsters. But it had to have some drawback, he thought. No matter how good Orochimaru was, even the Sanin can overlook things that others tend to notice. Unfortunate for him, he currently had no means to fight within a dim closed space, his jutsu was severely limited in this case and the only weapon he had on his person was his black short sword. Surely enough, his radio communications device had made a sound and soon, there were encounters inside the base where there was enough room to fight. He was glad he got Guy to go along with him while Choji and Ino were supported by Asuma. A group of three people had soon entered his vision, Guy was quick to take point and charged at the enemy like a sharp spear. Dynamic entry. Guy shouted and performed a flying kick to one of their opponents who was sent flying away from Guy's kick. Shikamaru, quick to draw his sword in a reverse grip, managed to slash one of his opponents down who fell to ground in a thud, the toxin in his blade taking place. He noticed a torch flickering to the side and immediately had his shadow go to work, it morphed into a fine needle and pinned the cursed seal user down as it branched off into multiple needles and piercing the enemy's thick flesh before Guy had punched the seal user so hard that the man was planted to the wall and it caved from Guy's strength. No wonder Guy Sensei is Kakashi Sensei's rival, and no wonder Asuma thought that Guy was enough help to be Shikamaru's vanguard. The man was a beast with his hand-to-hand -hand skills, almost unstoppable and he wasn't even using the eight gates. Shikamaru-kun, I believe that we are experiencing harsher and harsher resistance as we go inside. But there are no sightings of Orochimaru and Kabuto, did the others have better luck? Shikamaru shook his head, no, sensei, Asuma-sensei and the others are still busy drawing attention. Ino has made some headway, but she's currently bogged down by another group. The Anbu had managed to regroup and are currently supporting Ino. At this rate, we will tire ourselves out before we can even begin collecting the information we need. A proposal then, Guy replied, a grin on the man's face as he continued. I will blaze a trail from here to the very end of this base. I will take the lead and overtake our comrades and from this point, I will take down all within my way. Guy then got into the eight gates formation stance and began building up power. Shikamaru could tell how much chakra was pouring out of the man as one by one, the gates opened within his body and began surpassing his limits. Hachiman Tonko, Shomen Kai, Eight Gates Formation, Gate of Pain Release. Power. This was what Shikamaru could gather as Guy had unleashed four of the eight gates right before his very eyes, the chakra in the air thickened and gale force wind suddenly burst out from the density of chakra suddenly and violently awakened from his person. Blood vessels dilated and Guy's skin turned red as his muscles began to feel the effects of his blood going to every cell in his body. Guy then bared down and took formation of a runner's stance before he rushed inside in a sonic boom leaving his wake. In another part of the labyrinth, Eno was suddenly bombarded by the rush of so much chakra escaping from one place. What is this? Eno asked out of nowhere as they advanced deeper into the base. 
One of the masked Anbu had replied for her, a censor too, huh? Guy San has begun to use the Hachiman. Another one of the masked elite continued, this time, a purple-haired female Anbu member, we should not let this get to waste. We advance further. We should be able to scour the base better with Guy San leading the charge. The other two Anbu members nodded their heads as Eno began moving as well. These guys work fast. Eno thought as she saw the Anbu members began forming a three-man arrowhead formation as the two in support began blasting and slicing away anyone to their front. Eno was sure of it. These highly trained soldiers were seemingly untouchable. Professional, efficient and unfazed, they moved throughout these corridors like a well-oiled machine, capable of bulldozing their way through as much as one of their senseis. And their movements leave no waste or room for openings. This was the kind of stuff that Sasuke was training in. Dangerous and calculating soldiers whose loyalty were firmly placed within the village. Konoha's elite of the elite. As she makes her way further and further within the base, she noted that these very skilled shinobi had a certain monotone that escaped their lips. Their voices seemed devoid of conflict. A will of iron, she noted and then the Anbu team stopped when they had managed to enter a room. Ino followed suit. Where are we? One of the Anbu then pointed to a tube filled with liquid at the center of the room, beneath and above this structure were countless and haphazardly laid out tubes and surrounding the room at the very edges of it were machines. Gather up what you can find, notes, charts, everything. This place looks like a lab. The female Anbu, now identified as the squad leader commanded, her subordinates were quick to obey and began scurry about to look for anything that they might find important. Well, it's more of a prison than a lab. They all stopped. All Anbu members were quick to grab the handle of their blades with Eno following suit. She was taught basic sword handling by her father in the last few months when she asked him how to protect herself better. Inoichi went out of his way to give her the best of what he could offer. Man, you guys are scary and jumpy. I can't believe you people wanted to raid this place. You got some serious balls if you want to tangle with Orochimaru this badly. The water inside the tank stirred, and a form of a boy began taking shape but only the upper body. The boy smirked, the outlines in his body were taking shape. A prisoner, eh, are you one of Orochimaru's experiments? One of the masked shinobi asked, the boy inside answered with a nod of his head. That guy has a twisted curiosity concerning the human body. He's practically experimented on almost all the people inside this base, throwing away the dead and then removing the sanity of the others to be killed by his assistant. The prisoner commented as managed to look at Eno's sword and smirked. That's a nice sword you have there, can I have it? Weirdo. Eno commented internally but did not speak, opting to let this prisoner of theirs to do the talking, he was a chatterbox telling all of this to them. But she wasn't sure if she should believe this boy or not, the others around looked like they were cautious as well. Can you tell us where Orochimaru keeps his files? Eno asked this. The prisoner merely pointed to his holding area and said, I'm a prisoner here for who knows how long. Hell if I know where that freak keeps his stuff. Right, stupid question. The boy then continued, lots of people here are experiments, nobody but Orochimaru and his assistant knows where he keeps what. It was then that the purple-haired Anbu spoke as she drew her sword. If we set you free now, will you tell us anything that you know of your captor? The boy nodded, beats being inside here, okay, shoot. Wait, you aren't seriously offering your answers before we set you free, are you? What if we were actually bluffing? Eno asked, this kid was insane. It's not like I have anything to lose at this point and everything to gain. The name's Hazuka, Suigetsu, by the way. One of the Anbu then spoke, surprised by the boy's surname. Hazuka, from Kiri's clan, Hazuka. Suigetsu smirked once more, the one and only. Ino had heard the name of the Hazuka clan before, the second Mizukage apparently came from that clan. This boy has some clout. Change of plans, we're setting him free now. The Anbu captain command as she cut open the glass tube and letting the water flow out. As the water drained, nothing was left of the container. The water then began to stir as the boy slowly began to form from the water rising up from the puddle and his previous colorless form began to fill out, crouching as he did so. What's with the sudden change of heart? Willing to trust me now? Suigetsu said with a smirk, the purple-haired Anbu merely scoffed at it and held her sword in a reverse grip, she charged her blade with lightning chakra and pointed the tip to the puddle beneath him. 
Don't get the wrong idea. We would have better chances of searching this hellhole with you than without. And a member of the Hazuka clan is more beneficial for us than not. Ushi, get this boy a pair of clothes. Ino, stand guard outside while he suits up along with Sabama. This place is overrun with cursed seal users everywhere. Stand by until I say we're ready to go. The two shinobi nodded and headed outside. Suigetsu obeyed the Anbu captain's orders and put on freshly cleaned Anbu uniform from the Anbu with the bull mask. Got a sword with you? Suigetsu asked the two, the Anbu captain scowled beneath her mask, don't push it. Suigetsu held his hands up, fine, fine, guess I'm just going to have to rely on Jutsu. This is lame. As of this moment, your life belongs to Konoha now, your freedom is debt that will be repaid. Now prepare yourself, we will go hunting. Suigetsu for the first time in years, now managed to walk on his own and he smirked. Freedom was a good thing. But these shinobi from Konoha sure do know how to drive a slave. Well, it was time to go robbing the snake fondler's castle off its treasures now. As they went outside, he saw the girl and the anbu fending off more of Orochimaru's cursed seal slaves. Suigetsu had to rub his eyes a little, he could have sworn that the girl's form was shimmering. Mixing genjutsu and swordsmanship, huh? There's something you don't see every day. I was then that he noticed that the girl's form now completely dissolved, vanishing into thin air as she reappeared on another side. A shower of gore soon happened as the girl cut down five cursed seal users in an instant. Megan. Yurei o Sasu, demonic illusion. Backstabbing ghost, Ino swung her sword sideways before sheathing the blade to her back. Those lessons from Kurenai were pretty handy. Suigetsu whistled. Konoha was not known for its swordsmen, but they sure as hell know how to fight with one. This little excursion of his got more interesting. We're blitzing. The Anbu captain informed her underlings and they all charged on with the same arrowhead formation as before but now with Ino and Suigetsu flanking them at the rear. It was then that they saw a human-sized meteor streaking past them at incredible speeds as he smashed his way into the darkness. What the hell? Suigetsu asked, startled that something like that came out of nowhere and his senses couldn't even feel that. Guy San. One of the others noted. Suigetsu was surprised at this, they know that freak. A shinobi village is a village laden with monsters like him. Nuke Nin make the mistake of thinking people like Guy San are harmless compared to the cutthroat and more violent life of being on the run. But he's the type of person that people need to be wary most of all. One of the Anbu, Ushi, mentioned as the squad captain continued. He's the type of person who does what he sets out to do. If he's going to kill you, he really will kill you. In another part of the base, Choji and Asuma were soon surrounded by crazed cursed seal users, most of them were grotesque, misshapen creatures at this point, losing their sanity and cognition and reducing them to rabid beasts. They growled as Choji and Asuma were placed back to back. The chain-smoking Junin smirked while sweat was pouring down from his forehead, chakra knives charged with wind and forming into an ethereal saber. He carefully wiped the sweat from his brow and said, I'm glad you powered through that training. Choji, or else you would have been left exhausted here. Choji held his staff close to him, although panting slightly, gave a nod, I'm glad I did too. These guys are relentless. Choji ducked just in time to avoid a clawed swipe from one of the crazed monsters and quick with his reflexes, Choji had gathered chakra to his free right hand and it began to grow to a size of an elephant and with it, jabbed the man straight to his chest. The strength of the punch sounded like thunder. A fierce shockwave escaped as the monster's body couldn't withstand the impact. Every bone inside him shattered with the ribs caving in and piercing the heart and lungs. Before the man was sent flying, the man was already dead just from that punch. The cursed seal receded, seemingly understanding that the life it was feeding off of was suddenly snuffed out and the man was sent flying upwards, towards the ceiling. The roof cracked from the single use of force. Asuma whistled. Choji's heart was paying off. All of that focused power without a single wasted movement and efficiency certainly was better contained and released as what Shizun has said. Choji. Asuma Sensei. Shikamaru had arrived. The boy who was left behind by Guy who decided to rush his way inside the stronghold had managed to arrive just in time to see the ceiling being embedded with a corpse. Shikamaru. Where's Guy? Asuma asked as he slashed another cursed seal user. He went on ahead and opened four of the eight gates. I don't know how long it will last but I decided to let him go and let the rest handle the deeper parts and help you two here. 
My guess he's with the Anbu and Eno and about to hit the deepest part of the base. We'll have swept the area by then hopefully. Shikamaru answered and the boy plunged his black short sword on to the nearest cursed seal user by the neck, now fully understanding what this cursed seal was capable of. I see, so in order to produce this in large quantities, Orochimaru had to decrease its potency. Shikamaru noted as he jumped and went to Asuma and Choji's side. So you could tell, huh? Asuma could tell that Shikamaru was able to deduce that these cursed seal users were not up to standard as they were hyped up to be. Those previous records that they had concerning their encounters with this type of empowered humans. I think this is a more thinned out version of the cursed seal. I had to gamble earlier and use my cage Nui to disable one and somehow it worked. My blade, not empowered by chakra can pierce through their normally tough skin. Mass production really does reduce a product's quality. But I guess Orochimaru couldn't find better henchmen and decided to use numbers instead. Shikamaru looked on to his side and vanished in a cloudless and soundless sunshine. Asuma grinned, his student certainly had talent, and even though Shikamaru can be lazy as all hell, he certainly shows brilliance when needed. In just a second later, Shikamaru had landed on top of one of the monsters and slapped one explosive tag on the back of the crazed user's head before Shikamaru vanished again and triggered the paper bomb to go off, taking out two more along with the poor henchman. We're currently five meters below ground and it is high noon. Choji, can you create an opening above that ceiling? Choji nodded at this and replied, I can, but it will probably take a lot out of me. That's fine. Give it your strongest attack. Asuma sensei and I will cover you. Choji grinned at this and molded chakra all around his body, the Akamichi air began shrinking in size, thinning slightly a little as his calorie control technique activated, blue, ephemeral butterfly wings formed behind his back as Asuma stood behind him and was in a boxing stance and punched another cursed seal user in the face with the knuckle duster part of his blade several times before beheading it. Shikamaru, who saw Choji began building up, weaved through a series of hand seals and ended it with the snake sign. Doden Jutsu, Asuma thought when he noticed that Shikamaru ended the seals. Doden, Shikyu no Sento, Earth Release, Earth Spire. Shikamaru shouted and slammed his right hand on the floor, his chakra melding with the earth. In an instant, multiple, tall almost column-like tall earth and spires rose around them, forming in a symmetrical pattern of rows and columns as Choji then jumped upwards and punched the ceiling, giving it with all his might as he shouted. Chowden B-A-K-U-G-E-K-I. His armored fist made its way to the ceiling and soon, something started to rumble. Above ground, the silent meadow of the forest soon changed as a bulge in the earth was seen and rumbled as it continued to rose up for a few seconds and then. Boom. Earth and debris exploded upwards like a geyser for at least 30 meters upwards and large clods of earth exploded from the force below. Trees were uprooted, stone crumbled and animals made themselves scarce. Down below, Choji landed panting and almost exhausted. Shikamaru responded seeing as sunlight made its way to where he was and Shikamaru grinned, he saw shadows appearing from the pillars he created and immediately went to work. Shikamaru stretched his shadow and upon each shadow of the columns, his shadow's range extended and with each increase in his range, his shadow had immobilized a cursed seal user and with each immobilized henchman, his shadow's range extended some more. By the end, with the exception of his sensei and Choji, he had immobilized an entire platoon of cursed seal users. Asuma Sensei. Asuma grinned and began performing his own set of seals and ended in the Tiger Seal, a fire-based jutsu. Shikamaru using a jutsu to merely extend his shadow was a pretty good plan. Choji. Get away now. Choji, surprising both Shikamaru and Asuma, moved so quick enough that he by the time Asuma had exhaled a large amount of explosive ash, Choji had stopped as Shikamaru's side. Kaden. Hisekisho, fire release. Ash cloud burning product. The ash soon detonated and soon immolated the remaining henchmen to their deaths. Shikamaru watched solemnly as he watched these poor people who had no choice but to fight for their enemy, who experimented on them to satiate a morbid curiosity. They did not have the right to refuse, and in the process, lost their minds and reduced to rabid animals. They had no choice but to do a mercy kill. Was that your footwork technique? Shikamaru asked, turning his mind away from such sad thoughts. Choji grinned as the boy sat down beside Shikamaru, clearly exhausted, its name is Kuppo, air walk. It adjusts my stride and efficiently increases my speed when I run. Good job, boys, we'll wait for the rest of the team. 
Looks like we'll be waiting until the others are done. Shikamaru nodded and looked up. Clearly, he was exhausted as well. He couldn't wait to get back home and spend the rest of his rest days sleeping at home. Training can wait. Eastern Sea, Natashiko Village. A large encirclement of slabs of stone erupted, in the middle of this enclosure were two people, a boy and a girl, at least 14 years of age. The boy was a sun-kissed blonde, wearing a standard flak vest over a black and orange long sleeve shirt and black pants. His affiliation to his village made clear on his forehead protector, a swirl in the image of a leaf. His face told his annoyance of the whole thing. He didn't want to be near this village any time soon due to this experience. In front of him stood a girl with long flowing black hair, wearing a tank top blouse of a darker shade of purple with the top near the breast covered with mesh armor and a pair of short shorts that covered at least her upper thighs. A kanai holster strapped to her left thigh with some bandages while the right had mesh armor going down to her legs. Her hands were covered by a pair of black gloves the girl then discarded her umbrella as she proudly showed her headband, the insignia of a flower with five petals and a star in its middle. At the edges of this makeshift arena stood Jiraiya and some of the sailors who were curious about this outcome, some watching in eagerness while others were placing bets. It was not often that sailors find some entertainment during work considering their occupation, but whatever they could find, they would come in droves. Just so we're clear here, I am going to indulge in your challenge just because I don't want to see people killing themselves if I can help it. I would have thrown the fight but then that'd probably be an insult to you and you might just kill us both. Naruto said with no hesitation. He really, really was going to have a talking to with Jiraiya when this was all over. Shizuka merely smiled and responded in a prim and proper voice, Oh, I wouldn't dream of it, Naruto-san. It's just like you, our word is our life. We must always uphold our word, for it is honor that we keep them. And you speak as if you can actually beat me. Naruto sighed. Yeah, yeah, I feel I should apologize for placing those burdens on you by my irresponsible master. As if on cue, Jiraiya was shouting at the end of the ring, I'm still here, Naruto. Whatever, Naruto said, dismissing his master's words to just get on with it. Shizuka also went into her stance, oh, I don't mind at all, really. Naruto's spine shivered at that as Shizuka continued with a blush on her face. Naruto squinted a little, was she breathing heavily? A strong man like you with such vast chakra as prime meat. Again, Naruto's spine shivered. And then, the two dashed at each other meeting at the middle, meeting the rules of all shinobi combat. The first option of the shinobi in combat, taijutsu. Shizuka went for a punch to strike first, confident with her own abilities, Naruto, nearly angled a block and stopped a punch that was headed towards his face. Naruto then parried the blow, and in quick succession, countered with his own punch with his free arm, that was parried by Shizuka with her own free arm. Naruto then went on the offensive and ducked, below and aimed for her torso with another punch, Shizuka angled her hand once more and prevented another blow by blocking and parrying as well. She then decided to kick as she grabbed his fist while Naruto ducked with the kick missing his head by a few centimeters. Seeing her chance, Shizuka capitalized on this position by performing an armbar, she locked Naruto's trapped hand between her legs and rolled in midair taking down Naruto to the ground aiming for a submission. The blonde, seeing as he was about to fall into an arm lock, rolled with Shizuka in midair to prevent her twisting her arm and allow her leverage. He dropped on the ground as did Shizuka, but the lock was incomplete. The blonde managed to yank his hand away as Naruto jumped back. Shizuka was good, she almost got me with that. Naruto thought in cold sweat. Naruto may not be as proficient with taijutsu, but he was no slouch either, the almost instinctual ability to act in highly adaptive reflexes is what mostly helped him in his scuffles. Jiraiya was right, a good taijutsu specialist was a highly experienced one. Rethinking his options to engage in close quarters combat. I am certainly the better one at hand to hand alone, he must have realized. But he's certainly stronger he's probably faster too and he's only sizing me up. Shizuka got up, and leaned down, in that case. She dashed at the blonde, I can capitalize on this advantage. Naruto was quick to react, just before Shizuka can reach within his range, Naruto had made the decision to be on the defensive. Her punch was blocked with his right elbow hitting the side of her fist. She was suddenly surprised when with that move, 
Naruto rolled with that punch by parrying the punch with his elbow and placing her in perfect striking distance of his fist as he reared his right hand back. That was pretty decent move, she thought, and the punch was sent flying at her face, she angled her head a little and the fist missed her completely, but the force of the punch had nicked her at her cheek producing a little bit of blood. I was right. He has power in those punches. Shizuka concluded as she jumped to the side and began performing hand seals. Ninjutsu. Naruto was quick to react. When she held hands together to form seals, Naruto was already performing his own ninjutsu, and he executed his technique faster than hers because it only needed one hand sign. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, Shadow Clone Technique, two clones popped into existence in a white cloud of smoke beside the blonde already engaging her in action. Shizuka stopped her hand seals in favor of retreating back renewing her set of seals again. An advanced cloning technique. This boy is no slouch. She had heard about cloning techniques from her master about powerful shinobi who do cloning techniques is very competent and highly skilled. Cloning techniques were mere distractions at its origin, but those that can interact with the environment were a major jump from its parent jutsu. She could not finish. The two clones began harassing her with fists and kicks around her. She could keep up, but it would not be for long. The clones, she noted were very coordinated in their attacks, she saw feints and blocks, covering their openings and weaknesses, their footwork were in sync. She shuddered to think that she had opened a realm she did not think she was ready. Then another clone had appeared this time at her side, a fist hidden by his body, she couldn't tell where he was aiming at, but soon made its way when she felt pain. He had managed to hit her in the abdomen and the punch certainly did not hold back. She staggered a little before she dodged a kick and then another from a follow-up from another clone, as if they were cornering her. When she jumped back, she kicked her seal weaving into high gear and finally let out her own ninjutsu. Natashiko Ryu Koha Rapuken, Natashiko style, roaring gale chop. She thrusted her right hand forward with her fingers straight and outstretched and a powerful shockwave escaped from her fingers. Naruto was alerted of such a powerful jutsu that he jumped away immediately, his clones did not fare much. They were soon dispelled after being hit with a powerful gale. Naruto wasn't worried for now. He had after all, managed to get the first hit. I must say, you are as I had hoped you to be, Naruto-sama. Naruto shivered at that suffix that Shizuka added, that chill seemed to have brought on a cold wind around him. This girl was relentless. Perhaps he should respect that. It was now that Naruto noticed Shizuka holding several kunai in both her hands. He raised an eyebrow at this. Weapons proficiency. I think she just got serious. Uh, we're in a duel right? Are you seriously aiming to kill? Naruto asked. Shizuka's gaze sharpened and replied, I aim for nothing less with your skill. She then began unleashing her knives at him quick, they were at least a bit faster than what he saw with Tenten. Natashiko Ryu. Shinku Enbu, Natashiko style crimson dance performance. And true to the name, her unleashing her weapons at him looked like a dance. Every step was calculated and coordinated and with every step she unleashed her knives one by one. Naruto dodged the first, but noted the second was already passed halfway between them. Naruto rolled to ground to dodge, as another made its way to his nose. The blonde leaned back and fell on the floor. He log rolled to his left just as another kunai went past him. He stopped when one narrowly hit him in his path and rolled backwards before somersaulting backwards as three kunai made its way towards him. Naruto gathered chakra to his hands and grinded it against each other. He had his fingers in a chopping motion as blue chakra became visible a silent gust of wind escaped him. Kuken Zangeki, space cutting strike, and with a sweep of his hand sideways, he had immediately cut down the three kunai before it hit him. The cut was clean and quick as the kunai were bisected and their trajectory stopped. Naruto landed on the ground as he dashed towards Shizuka and cutting down her attack one by one. He had decided dodging was useless. The technique that Shizuka used with her weaponry were hard to dodge. He was prone to committing mistakes with dodging anyway, but it didn't mean that he couldn't stop this technique. Another invisible blade of chakra surged from his other hand and Naruto began cutting down kunai after kunai. Shizuka was surprised. She had never seen anyone face the attack head on. Unless you were a Hyuga or someone with a mobile defensive jutsu, the Shinku Enbu would always be able to meet its mark. But this boy defied conventional fighting tactics in order to take her head on. And his tactic worked. 
He had begun cutting down Kanai after Kanai against him and gaining ground fast. Shizuka had shifted to her tactic and went back to using Koha Rapuken and sent another shockwave at the blonde who dodged the blow by sidestepping but he was not stopping. And when he got close, Shizuka was ready for him with another shockwave attack. Naruto was surprised, having no time to dodge, he was forced to take the attack head on and was blasted back by her technique. He was thrown back and landed on the ground, skidding back as he stopped at least 20 meters away from his opponent. Tenrin would be useless against her. Naruto thought, there was no spinning motion involved. He could use the Rasengan to power up the Tenrin, but he was not aiming to destroy everything in sight. He had to think of some way to beat this girl without resorting to maim and kill. He got up and noted blood had dripped from his forehead and lip. He smiled and wiped away the blood. This girl was not as she seemed. Time to step up the game. Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Instead of relying on two clones, he was going to use more. Five clones popped into existence, surrounding Shizuka. The girl was startled once more when they began to enter in a formation. A chaotic one, she noted. But it seemed like it was serving its purpose. One of the clones attacked, and Shizuka dodged but as she was dodging, another clone was already making its way to her blind side, she quickly made a few hand signs, minding the clones swarming her left and right. One got lucky and managed to kick her behind her left knee forcing her down forcing her to stop weaving seals. Naruto, not about to let her do her jutsu, exerted pressure by producing three more clones. Naruto grabbed one clone and it transformed into a Fuma shuriken. Naruto unfurled the shuriken and tossed it at her, knowing that Shizuka was skillful enough to evade his attack as the two clones rushed towards her. Shizuka then leapt forward tackling one of the clones and then jamming her fingers with extreme prejudice on the clone's chest, a shockwave, with a force that had nowhere else to go after the clone popped, recoiled and launched Shizuka in midair. Quickly thinking, Shizuka spun and began another used another technique. Enbu. Ni no dan, dance performance, second step. She spun in midair like a top and in quick succession, unleashed a hail of knives towards his clones, dispelling them quickly. Naruto then formed another set of clones and rushed at Shizuka as they increased in speed. At the side of the ring, Jiraiya noticed that Naruto was not using his more destructive jutsu. He's holding back. No, it's because this isn't a life or death battle that he thinks subduing the opponent is the best way to go. He has yet to use the Rasengan. Quite the tenacious little guy, isn't he? Jiraiya chuckled and said, he has guts, that's for sure. The clones had managed to get close and Shizuka stopped, gathering chakra to her legs. She strengthened them and raised it above her head before smashing it on the ground. Naruto was familiar with this technique, or at least, he noted how similar this was to Tsunade's Sudenkyaku. Koha Senkai Jiri, hardliner revolving cut. Her heel crashed to one of the clones and with gale force winds descending, caused an immediate explosion around her. Three of the clones were immediately dispelled but five more of them were still here. With a quick weaving of seals, she ended with the seal of the dragon and inhaled deeply before pushing out wind from her mouth. Resenku, violent whirlwind. A spinning wave motion blast escaped from her lips and Naruto raised an eyebrow at that. This was his chance. Naruto began meeting chakra and performed a set of seals ending with the seal of the dragon as well and gathered chakra to his arms, gusts of wind escaped and he aimed it at the big powerful wind jutsu heading his way. Tenrin, Providence Wheel. Naruto dashed forward and slammed his jutsu to the girl's attack. Gale force winds died down, and the natural whistle of the winds was music to his ears as it began to surround him. Ura Tenrin Kazahana, Reverse Providence Wheel Windmill Flower. Shizuka was surprised, she had never heard of jutsu like that. Naruto, for the first time of this fight, grinned. Shizuka, I know you might hate me for this, but even if I win, I am not marrying you. The girl closed her eyes, seemingly accepting of that fate, but it seemed she was determined. But this fight between them was over. I understand. I lose this match. Naruto gave a sigh of relief and let the winds die down around him, deactivating his jutsu. By Natashiko tradition, I am obliged to make you my husband. But you seem adamant on stopping that from happening. Exactly why? Naruto grinned and answered sincerely, I'm with someone else. She's a shy and quiet girl, but she puts on a brave front for others in kind, she often says things that make me happy, she's dedicated and she works hard for what she wants. 
She can be a bit hesitant and clumsy, but I like her the way she is. She's pretty, prettier with her dedication and devotion. I wouldn't trade her for whatever else that I may receive. And the way she dedicates herself, makes me think about supporting her, helping her through it all, making her dreams a reality. I'm sorry, but I think I'm crazy for that girl. I can't accept what you are willing to give. Shizuka, though upset, seemed to look accepting of his answer. Really, the way you speak about her, I am quite jealous. Shizuka said this as she turned away from the blonde. You are free from our bonds. Please leave the island before I change my mind. Naruto, wordlessly bowed at her and went away, victorious. Back at the boat, an hour later, Naruto slumped at the deck and gave a long and tired groan. I really need to stop encountering talks about marriages for a while. The one with Hinata made the other Hyuga except for Hinata's sister to glare at me like they want to skin me alive. But this just takes the cake. Jiraiya grinned at his pupil, well aren't you glad you got away from that commitment problem? Naruto stared at Jiraiya with disappointment for a few seconds and replied, yeah, sure did and I didn't even make up a stupid promise of passing the buck on to the next poor schmuck that would carry throughout generations. Jiraiya replied, come on, you're still on about that. You got your clean slate, right? Though I should tell you, encounters with women of that village are definitely going to be frequent in our country soon enough. Naruto's eyebrow was twitching as he glared at his sensei who looked at him like he was growing two heads. What? You didn't think it all ends with one challenge, right? There's no rule in their village that says they can't challenge a man more than once. Color drained from Naruto's face as he asked rhetorically, you're kidding, right? Jiraiya grinned at him with a stupid look on his face, who the hell do you think you're talking to, kid? I'm a super pervert, I know the ins and outs of things that could make you do the horizontal dance. Now how the hell is he going to explain this to Hinata when he gets back? Back at the island, Shizuka stared at the sailing ship, now back in her kimono. Her guardian stood beside her, she looked at the ship as well and asked their former leader's pupil. Is it wise to let this boy go? He has clearly won the duel and you are within your full rights to seduce him. I am well aware, but he clearly has eyes for another. Besides, I thought it was premature of me as well to have challenged him. Her guardian raised an eyebrow at this, there is no rule in our village that says we are not allowed to challenge more than once. Are you sure of giving him up? A lady must clinch all forms of opportunity, besides, who said I was giving up? Shizuka's smile returned. In two years' time, I shall go to Fire Country and to Konoha directly to issue my challenge there. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.